Number 10, Jonathan Walker. US agent might be a hero now in the comics, but when he started out in the 616 continuity, he was manipulated into becoming a villain. Jonathan Walker was initially known as antagonistic hero Super Patriot, who did his best to discredit Captain America, claiming that he himself stood for the United States' true ideals. As a result of Red Skull's meddling and manipulation, he was appointed to replace Steve Rogers as the new Captain America after Rogers stepped down as the government actually owned the title and refused to let him keep the title if he wasn't going to be working for them. As Captain America, Walker took a very extreme and violent approach that put him into direct conflict with Rogers, who was currently going by the mantle of the Captain. In the end, the Captain defeated Walker and after Skull's involvement in the ordeal was revealed, the two ended up teaming up to take him down, starting off on Walker's path to redemption as hero US agent. Number 9. Cap Wolf. Werewolf Captain America isn't as much an alternate version of Cap as it is a distinct moment in Cap's history where he happened to be transformed into a werewolf. Captain America ends up becoming a werewolf while on the trail of Colonel John Jameson who had gone missing. Captain America himself had reason to suspect that something awful had happened to Jameson who it seemed may be plagued by his wolf side once more. Jameson was known in the past for operating as man wolf. It seemed as though a wolf like creature or werewolf was responsible for a series of murders. In the end, however, Cap's trail ended up leading him into a much more complex and disturbing plot where a villain was attempting to use a recreated werewolf by night wolf serum to turn people into werewolves. Captain America became one of their victims and for a time became a werewolf himself. Granted, he was still a hero at this point, but werewolves in general are considered to be somewhat uncontrollable monsters who are at least occasionally ruled by their own bloodlust. So I think we can at least partially count Cap Wolf. Also, I needed to complete the monster trifecta. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more Captain America lists, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, MCU US Agents. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, US Agent John Walker accidentally becomes an evil version of Captain America without really intending to do that. Really, it's more complicated than him just being straight up evil as it is with most Marvel Cinematic Universe antagonists. Walker really wants to do right by the Captain America mantle and do it justice. He's a soldier who has worked super hard to earn this title, but also, although his heart might be in the right place, that doesn't mean that he knows the best way to approach replacing Cap or doing right by his legacy. Walker ends up becoming misguided as a result of dealing with so much disrespect from those around him, and as a result of him not being you know, as powerful as Cap would be because he doesn't have the super soldier serum. He realizes that being chosen and respected as the new Captain America by the government doesn't necessarily mean that the people of the United States will also respect you, nor that Steve's actual allies and friends will respect you as his replacement either. After he loses his own best friend, Lamar Hoskins, he becomes completely fed up with trying to figure out how to do what's right and instead decides to do what he feels needs to be done. This makes him much more violent and much more dangerous, turning him into an enemy of Falcon and Winter Soldier and leading the government to later on remove his title, his honors, and basically just overall dismiss him. Fortunately, the US agent still found a place on what will likely be either the MCU Thunderbolts or Dark Avengers team. TBD. Or at least to be declared, if not to be determined. Number 7, Mutant Captain America. This version of Captain America was a mutant who ended up replacing the original Captain America after he died in a sentinel attack. He wasn't just given the mantle of Cap either, but also ended up receiving the Super Soldier Serum. He had this and his own mutant powers besides, which made him pretty crazy powerful. Although the mutant version of Cap had good intentions, his powers were somewhat uncontrollable, which was a big problem. His powers going haywire was what ended up causing the death of his own group, the Six, and the Avengers, who he was at the time fighting against. This caused him to lose his sanity, turning him into a full on villain and a loose cannon who attacked and defeated pretty much everyone who came after him. Except Havoc, who managed to successfully kill and defeat the crazed mutant version of Captain America. 
poor mutant Captain America. It sounds like it was a rough go, you know? Coming in at number six, we have the infamous zombie Wolverine. Many superheroes and villains of the Marvel Universe found themselves infected with an undead plague on the alternate world of Earth 2149, but Wolverine might be the character who experienced the oddest side effects from becoming a member of the Zombie Legion. Initially fighting alongside Magneto to help defeat the undead threat with the X-Men, Wolverine was eventually bitten and overwhelmed while attempting to defend Nick Fury and S.H.I.E.L.D.'s main base of operations. Turning against Magneto, this version of Wolverine slowly discovered his healing factor was affected by his zombification, meaning his arms could no longer support the adamantium claws throughout his body. Attacking any living thing he could with the shreds that remained of his limbs, this version of Wolverine would go on to even consume Galactus, becoming a cosmic undead threat to the rest of this very doomed Marvel Universe. Coming in at number five, we have the villainous Wolverine of an alternate future, Saberclaw. Hailing from Earth 982, this son of Wolverine and an unknown woman absolutely hates his original father, so much so that it seems to have literally changed him into appearing more reminiscent of Sabretooth than his actual dad. Wearing adamantium sheaths on his bone claws to make them even deadlier, Saberclaw was briefly a member of this universe's Sinister Six before eventually being convinced to put his differences aside with his father and help defend the world from the threat of Galactus and the daughter of Loki. Just another day in complicated comic book family dynamics. Coming in at number four, we have Dakin, the dark son of Wolverine. Named after the Japanese term for mongrel dog, Dakin is the tragic child that Wolverine never knew about, his mother being murdered before Wolverine even knew he had a kid. Cut from his mother's body, Dakin was raised to hate his father, and in their very first encounter, slashed open his stomach and left him to die. With the same incredible healing abilities and bone claws as his dad, Dakin has had a long road of trying to find his proper place in the world, and has fought on the sides of both good and evil over the course of his tragic life, but hopefully he'll stay more on the side of good going forward. Coming in at number three, we have Hydra Wolverine. Hailing from the reality known as Earth 1720, this version of Wolverine is fully committed to the evil ideology of the organization Hydra, complete with a new green and yellow color scheme to his costume. Married to this universe's version of the Invisible Woman, who also happens to be this universe's version of Madame Hydra, this Wolverine was apparently successful in conquering his home reality along with his lover, and has since begun to travel the multiverse searching for more worlds to destroy in the universe's most twisted romantic honeymoon. Luckily for the Marvel multiverse, this Wolverine would be defeated by a variant of Kitty Pride and the rest of the Exiles, who wound up tricking him into stabbing himself with his own adamantium claws. Better luck next time, Hydra. Coming in at number two, we have the Wolverine from the Age of Apocalypse universe. In an alternate world where Charles Xavier is dead and Magneto is leader of the X-Men, Wolverine is a brutal warrior named Weapon X who has to be constantly subdued by the psychic abilities of Jean Grey in order to be a functioning member of the X-Men team. Eventually losing a hand while going on a suicide mission to rescue this version of Jean from a version of Cyclops, this version of Wolverine for a time had heroic ambitions but gave them up after being granted the power of the Celestials and turned into Weapon Omega, now determined to bring about the evolutionary future that he'd initially stop the mutant apocalypse from achieving and declaring war against all of humanity. This new Weapon Omega is the farthest thing possible from Wolverine's usual heroics. And finally, coming in at our top spot, we have Brother Mutant, an evil variant of Wolverine combined with some of his greatest allies and greatest foes. On Earth-127, a male variant of the Scarlet Witch, known as the Scarlet Warlock, attempted to cast a spell that would transfer Wolverine's out adamantium skeleton to Magneto, thus giving Magneto an incredible power boost given his magnetic abilities. However, something with the spell went wrong, and the Scarlet Warlock, Wolverine, Magneto, Quicksilver, and the villain Mesmero were all merged into a singular being known as Brother Mutant. All five of these mutants' powers combined into one villainous figure, Brother Mutant was such a powerful threat that a multiversal team of other, more heroic Wolverines had to be assembled specifically to stop him just to ensure that all of that power wasn't unleashed on the rest of the Marvel Multiverse. Number 10, 
Age of X Avengers. In the Age of X storyline, the mutant population were feared, and after a phoenix shaped explosion leveled Albany, the culling of the mutants began. In response to this, the mutant Magneto used his powers to literally steal several buildings from New York and form Fortress X, a safe haven for mutant kind. This led to the creation of a team of non mutant heroes by General Frank Castle and led by Captain America to hunt down this resistance of mutants. The team was made up of Captain America, Ghost Rider, who was killed prior to the actual assault on Fortress X, the Hulk, Invisible Woman, Redback, who is this universe's Jessica Drew, and Iron Man slash Steel Corpse. While the team murdered a lot of mutants, Cap eventually called them off to instead defend the mutants, which activated Steel Corpse's Code Omega, causing them to take him out. There was also Plan B, which was the two megaton chemical that was carried by the Hulk. Luckily, the mutant population survived this twisted Avenger team. Number 9, Ultimate Avengers. Not to be confused with the Ultimates, who are very much their own thing. This team of Avengers is actually called the Avengers, but is not the Avengers equivalent from the 1610 Ultimate Universe. Are you confused yet? Basically, in the Ultimate Universe, the Avengers team that we know and love from 616 is a little different, including in name. On Earth 1610, the Earth's mightiest heroes go by the name of the Ultimates and are pretty buddy buddy with S.H.I.E.L.D. and its director, Nick Fury. However, there is a team in this universe that uses the Avengers moniker, but they are quite different from the Avengers we know from Earth 616. On 1610, the Avengers team is more like DC's Suicide Squad. The team is made up of characters who are seen as more disposable by S.H.I.E.L.D and who are more anti-heroes or just straight up villains. They are a black ops team who is usually brought on for less mm, publicly marketable missions and jobs. Number 8, Deathlock Nation. On Earth 11045, the superhumans grew out of control. They began to take the law into their own hands more and more, acting as judge, jury, and executioner. This led to popular support from the people for Operation Deathlock. Operation Deathlock was a plan conceived by Weapon Infinity of the Weapons Plus breeding facility called the world to convert all superhumans into deathlocks. The project began small with a few normal human deathlocks, and then those deathlocks targeted specific heroes who were killed and then converted into super deathlocks. No hero could stand for long, and soon all superheroes were converted into mindless police robots, which actually resulted in a utopia. Eventually, these deathlocks began spreading into other timelines and realities, only to be stopped by apocalypse. This eventually led a team composed of deathlock Captain America. Cyclops, Spider-Man, Elektra, Hawkeye, and The Thing to come into conflict with Earth-616. Number 7, Hank Henshaw. Hanky Boy here was already a villain of Superman's from past stories, but when Superman was killed by Doomsday, Hank, unable to directly get revenge against Superman himself, decided to attack his reputation instead. Come on, man. He's already dead. Not cool, dude. Not cool. After creating a Kryptonian cyborg body using the birthing matrix, he took on the guise of soups and went about destroying Superman's memorial plaque. Then he saved the president to get clout so the president would recognize him as the real Superman. Eventually, he and Mongol destroyed Coast City and the real reborn Superman, with the help of others, defeated and discredited him. At least he looked really cool. Number 6, Overman. Now this version of our favorite red and blue man didn't end up in Kansas when he was ejected from Krypton. No, no, no. This Kal-El found himself in Sudetenland, Germany in 1938 and was acquired by a certain mustached fascist. With Kal and Kryptonian tech, the Reich were obviously able to win World War II and rule over the entire planet. Later, Overman would become disgusted with the stashed man when the Holocaust had been finalized, although he still served the state. It's kind of a weird set of morals there, dude. Eventually, he was cloned and received a love in the form of Overgirl, but after her death, he was completely heartbroken and he supplied information to the freedom fighters who long opposed the fascists, which eventually led to the death of the new Reichman, uh, the the Justice League, and the city of Metropolis. With the grief of all these losses holding him down, he was overthrown by his friend. Damn. Kinda hard to feel bad for him though. Number 5. Injustice Superman. The Superman of the Injustice universe has pretty much the same history as the baseline Superman. But, when the Joker kidnaps the pregnant Lois Lane, it lures Superman into a trap of fear gas. In his poisoned state, Superman hallucinates his true love as the villain Doomsday and instantly attacks, flying Lois and his unborn child into space, killing them, and inadvertently causing a nuclear bomb to destroy his city, Metropolis. After suddenly losing his city, wife, and baby, Superman goes into an honestly understandable rage. 
bursting into the interrogation room where Batman is learning the true intentions of the Joker and plunges his super fist right through the guy's chest. Following these events, Superman takes control of the Earth and rules it as a tyrant. Fortunately, Batman forms an insurgency to try and beat this corrupted Superman, eventually enlisting the aid of another Earth's Justice League. And I guess technically whoever plays the tied in video game to defeat him and save the day. Number four, Brutal. Brutal is a cloned version of Superman, but unlike a certain bizarre version of Superman, who we will talk about later, don't worry, this duplication was done by none other than Darkseid himself. He raised the resulting clone into a soldier, nay, a weapon and unleashed him on the superheroes of Earth 2, along with Steppenwolf and the other hunger dogs, but they don't really matter. When Steppenwolf tried to subvert his master Darkseid and take Earth as his own, Brutal Brutali murders him with his heat vision, establishing his devotion to his Lord Darkseid. Let me make my intentions clear. Hail Darkseid! Which is just a sweet line after you murdered a general of Darkseid. The Earth became lost to Darkseid's minions and eventually, after a lot of other stuff, Cal Zod, Earth 2's Superman, faced Brutal in combat and after a furious battle, showed that Brutal was just an imitation. And a cheap one at that, as his body began to deteriorate and the day was saved. Uh, again. Hey guys, uh, just wanted to say a quick thanks for watching. We hope you're enjoying the video. If you are, why not head on over to that pretty little subscribe button and give us a follow and a like. You guys are the reason we can even be here in the first place. Hee hee hee, love you. Okay, on to the top three. Number three, Super Doom. On Earth 45, Lois Lane, Jimmy Olsen, and Clark Kent are scientists instead of reporters, and they use their smarts to build a machine that can turn thoughts into reality, which, I mean, how the heck did they think that was a good idea? I can think of 10 things right now that should never become reality. Anyways, uh, using the aforementioned thought to form machine, they try to create a being called Superman, who would be capable of doing amazing things and who could save worlds. But when they are forced to sell their idea to Overcorp, they decide to rebrand and end up creating Creating a monstrosity. Superman, the last night of tomorrow. Or Super Doom. With a corporate fueled agenda of destroying all competition, Super Doom quickly becomes the strongest super being on its own planet and then enters the bleed space to murder all other versions of Superman. Of course, Bad guys never win forever, so after defeating and devouring multiple different Superman of multiple different Earths, he was stopped by the Superman and Lex Luthor of Earth-22, who stranded him between universes. He's since been used in a few other storylines and remains one of the most formidable evil versions of Superman to this day. I mean, he didn't even die. Number two, Bizarro. When Lex Luthor gets the plans for a device called the Duplicator Ray, he modifies the device and uses it to try and create a clone of Superman who will follow his every order without question. But since our Lex can't seem to do anything right, the resulting doppelganger is an unintelligent, unpredictable, backwards version of Superman, eventually known as Bizarro. Bizarro is a main villain for Superman, appearing in many, many stories. And I'm so glad because, gosh, he's just so fun to see. Eventually, Bizarro gets a case of the blues and longs for love and gets the hots for Lois Lane. Lois isn't really interested, but being the great gal that she is, she uses the duplicator ray on herself, creating a bizarro Lois Lane. And the two eventually leave Earth to settle another Earth-like planet they fittingly name Bizarro World. Or, and forgive me here, Hetre, which is Earth backwards, which they populate with more and more duplicates of themselves. But don't worry, they have pretty rock necklaces that say Bizarro, and Bizarro Lois won, so we don't get confused. Number one, Ultraman. In the universe of Earth 3, things are a little turned upside down. Instead of being driven by the morals of good versus evil, the people of this universe are inspired by strength above all else. I can't really relate. Born on a dying Krypton where Kryptonians evolved to be empowered by green kryptonite to a maniacal version of Jor-El aptly named Jor-Il, baby Kal-Il is jettisoned off to Earth. But instead of the classic morals, he's instead inspired by his father to become the strongest possible being with absolutely no weaknesses in himself and the others around him. When Cal lands on the farm of Johnny and Martha Kent, he uses pieces of green kryptonite to empower himself and forces the dysfunctional couple to be his parents until the totally mature age of seven, when he murders them both and sets the farm ablaze. Eventually, this self-proclaimed Ultraman murders the President of the United States of America and takes control of the world, creating the crime syndicate of America with other evil alternate versions of classic characters, including an evil Wonder Woman, Superwoman, and evil version of Batman, Owlman, 
who have a pretty toxic love triangle. Coming in at number 10, we have the Iron Goblin. Coming from an alternate universe where the Spider Island event wound up being permanent, Tony Stark was initially transformed into a human-spider hybrid under the control of the villainous Spider Queen. During a battle with the Resistance, however, Tony was sprayed with the same goblin formula that had corrupted the mind of Norman Osborn, transforming Tony Stark into the Iron Goblin with a mechanical new costume to match. And while this version of Tony would eventually decide to sacrifice himself in a last moment of humanity before his goblin insanity fully took over, the combination of Iron Man and Green Goblin tech is still a pretty terrifying combo that Spider-Man should hope never reappears. Coming in at number 9, we have the corrupted Iron Man from the controversial 90s event, The Crossing. When a variant of the time-traveling villain Kang the Conqueror, known as Immortus, began using the neural link in the Iron Man suit to secretly begin altering Tony Stark's brainwaves, Iron Man became a sleeper agent within the Avengers and eventually attacked his companions outright after secretly manipulating them for years. While eventually defeated by a time-traveling 19-year-old version of himself and then retconned into Tony going back to his usual status quo in the Marvel Universe, this controversial storyline shows what would happen if Iron Man truly turned out to be a traitor. Coming in at number 8, we have Iron Thor. During the event that saw God Emperor Doom in control of a Marvel Universe converted into a new battle world, Doom maintained his complete control over the many realms of battle world with a police force army known as the Thor Corps. One of the most powerful of Doom's personal army was the being known as Iron Thor, wearing a combination of the Iron Man armor and Thor's iconic helmet, and investigating any potential rebellions to his master Doom's rule. Even capable of wielding Mjolnir, this super powerful character still managed to be murdered by the hero Warrior Woman as an example of rebellion against Emperor Doom. He might have had a short life, but man, I really love that Iron Thor design. Coming in at number 7, we have the Steel Corpse. Hailing from Earth 11326, this version of Iron Man was pretty similar to our own, but with two key differences. He's permanently fused with his suit, and he absolutely hates mutants. Fighting alongside other villainous Avengers to wipe out this universe's X-Men, this Iron Man's natural body died long ago after being melded with his machinery, and thus he jokingly calls himself the Steel Corpse as a way of coping with his morbid situation. This version of Iron Man had complete mastery of his weaponry, as they were literally a part of his body, and only a last second change of heart before sacrificing himself stops this Tony Stark from being one of the absolute worst. Coming in at number 6, we have the Batman of the Flashpoint universe, aka Thomas Wayne Sr. In a world where Bruce was gunned down by Joe Chill instead of his parents, Thomas Wayne became a dark and murderous red-tinted Batman, while Martha would be cursed to become this universe's version of the Joker. While initially an anti-hero ally during the first reveal of the Flashpoint universe, this Batman would go on to become a threat to the real Batman when he returned to the main DC universe and allied himself with Bane in order to get Bruce to quit being Batman forever. There's probably an easier way to get your son to stop being a superhero than allying yourself with a supervillain, but hey, I guess that's just some Wayne family drama that will continue to unfold as Thomas Wayne continues to make his way through the DC multiverse. Coming in at number 5, we have the Merciless, another of the Dark Knights. In an alternate universe in which Ares, the god of war, declared war against all of existence, Batman stood with the rest of the Justice League in a battle that literally lasted for eons, until the sole combatants left in the entire universe were Ares and Batman, still standing through sheer willpower alone. After landing a blow that knocked Ares' magical helmet off, Batman was forced to put the helmet on to finally defeat the God of War, leaving him the only survivor of this burned out universe. This Batman unfortunately became addicted to the power and bloodlust granted to him by the helmet, and joined forces with the rest of the Dark Knights in order to survive the destruction of his universe, going forth to find new worlds for him to become a new God of War against. Coming in at number 4, we've got another of the Dark Knights with Murder Machine. 
This version of Bruce Wayne comes from a universe very similar to the main DC continuity until the tragic death of Alfred Pennyworth at the hands of multiple Batman villains. Heartbroken and traumatized by the footage of the incident, Batman convinces his friend Cyborg to recreate Alfred's personality as an artificial intelligence. Unfortunately, this AI takes its task of protecting Batman far too literally, altering his brain chemistry to erase any sense of fear and completely replacing Bruce's frail human body with a metal replacement. Taking the name of Murder Machine, this Batman spread the Alfred AI throughout Gotham and was able to kill every criminal in Arkham Asylum, showing what would truly happen if Batman didn't have a heart. Coming in at number three, we have The Devastator, a horrifying combination of Batman and Doomsday. This story takes place on one of the many dark multiverse worlds that saw Superman going rogue and taking over the entire planet, even murdering his own wife. To stop the demented Man of Steel, this Batman was forced to ingest the Doomsday Virus, a last ditch effort to save the planet that gave Bruce the strength to kill Superman, but at the terrible cost of his own mind. Furthermore, the Doomsday Virus began to spread off Bruce's body and kill off the rest of this world, dooming the planet anyways, and leaving the Devastator as a beast-like Batman waiting for the rest of the Dark Knights to save him from his collapsing planet and give him a new target to hunt, even if eventually this Doomsday Batman hybrid would be defeated by, you guessed it, the real Superman. Coming in at number two, we have the Emperor of Shadow, aka Bruce Wayne. In a recent one-off issue entitled Batman Superman Authority Special, Batman discovers a reality from the dark multiverse where Ra's al Ghul's plans to dominate humanity have come to pass, and the League of Shadows has become an empire of shadows, controlling the entire world. To make matters worse, the leader of this empire is a Bruce Wayne who gave in to Ra's al Ghul's teachings and embraced his position as the world's new emperor. While Batman and Superman were eventually able to destroy the link between this world and the regular DC universe in order to prevent an invasion, this twisted version of Bruce Wayne is still out there, likely biding his time until the next opportunity arises for the Dark Multiverse to attack the regular multiverse once again. And finally, coming in at our top spot, we have the Batman Who Laughs. In a dark alternate world where the Joker realizes he's dying and begins a mass killing spree of everyone in Gotham, Batman is forced to finally kill his fated foe. Unfortunately, at the moment of death, Bruce was infected with a special brand of Joker venom that completely flipped his moral compass, but left intact all of his intelligence and planning. All of the chaos of the Joker with the brains of Batman, this supervillain is Bruce Wayne's worst nightmare come to life, and so far remains the most evil and deadly variant to ever be seen across the entire Dark Multiverse. Number 10, Dormammu Universe Strange. This alternate version of Stephen Strange is a loyal follower of Dormammu and hails from the reality of Earth 5113, also referred to as the Dormammu Universe. The Stephen Strange of Earth 616 ends up transporting himself and his team of defense Defenders here in issue number three of the 2005 Defender series. The Stephen Strange of this reality is bald and is revealed to be a servant of Dormammu, who rules over Earth. Oh dear. In this reality, Dormammu's servant Stephen Strange keeps Clea prisoner instead of being in a romantic relationship with her. Despite how he mistreats her, Clea still feels bad for Strange's predicament too, even crying for him, knowing of the reality that could have been for them both. Strange in this reality really gives me strong Jafar vibes. That's how I know he's evil. Number 9, Ultimate Doctor Strange Sr. In the Ultimate Reality, there are really two different versions of Doctor Strange. The more prominent one that most people know is actually Stephen Strange Jr., who is the son of the original Stephen Strange and his wife, Clea, whom you might also be familiar with from the 616 reality. Stephen Strange Sr. wasn't so much super evil in this reality, but he did do Clea dirty, likely because of his own trauma. You see, Clea and Stephen ended up married 
married, but this wasn't his first marriage. Stephen not only lost the fine motor skills in his hands when he was in that fateful car accident that changed him forever, in the 1610 universe he was driving drunk and his first wife, who was pregnant at the time, was also with him in the car. Now when the car crashed, his wife was killed and their future child was also lost. When Clea revealed that she was pregnant to Strange, he simply vanished, probably because of what happened before with his first wife. Clea looked everywhere but she could not find him. It was believed he either locked himself away in another dimension or took his own life, but either way, he was never seen again. Clea would go on a journey of mystical self discovery, similar to Steven after his accident, but would ultimately decide to raise her son without the knowledge of mysticism, with him believing that his father was merely a surgeon who had died. Until, of course, he goes on to become Stephen Strange Jr., who also kind of becomes like his dad, and then I'm pretty sure he gets killed like almost right away. Oh, the ultimate universe, what a strange place it was. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more Doctor Strange lists, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, Sorcerer Extreme. Sorcerer Extreme has the combined souls and powers of Frank Castle aka The Punisher and Doctor Stephen Strange, who show up basically as two entities in one package in Secret Wars Battle World issue number 1. Here they are on the run from the Infernal Four and end up facing off and defeating alternate versions of Hulk, Ghost Rider, Wolverine, and Spider-Man. While this makes the characters sound pretty evil, those four characters were actually the members of the Infernal Four, who were essentially corrupted from being trapped in the demonic domain. So basically, they were pretty evil themselves. Still, Sorcerer Extreme does kill people wielding magic guns, so he's somewhat questionable when it comes to the morals at least of his methods. Steven and Frank, as a result, seem to butt heads somewhat while sharing the same physical form. Number 7, Ultimate Venom. This version of the big gloopy hunger monster started in quite a different way than normal. This Venom started as a biological suit created by the fathers of Peter Parker and Eddie Brock. When this knowledge and the prototype suit fell into Peter and Eddie Brock Jr's hands, they decided to work on their father's project. After Peter had a dangerous run in with the suit and wanted to destroy it, Eddie exposed himself to the control sample of the suit he created, but he lost control, consuming a janitor and later two security guards. He went about surviving by consuming innocent bystanders and trying to consume or bond with Spider-Man. Eventually. Eddie slash Venom bonded with Carnage, stealing it from Gwen Stacy and becoming a monstrosity combo of the two. Number 6. Kingpin Venom In the alternate Earth TRN 421, the year is 2061, and Wilson Fisk the Kingpin has killed Eddie Brock, taking the Venom symbiote as his own, bonding with it. Which is really, really intimidating already, but then he modifies the suit to be able to travel through technology? He can basically travel through the internet, controlling cars, helicopters, and electronic billboards? I don't know. Okay, I don't know. In the end, Peter had to flee into the woods where King Venom followed. This part of the fight didn't last very long with Peter using the fire from a torch to detach the symbiote from Kingpin, saving the day. Number five, Old Man Logan slash Old Man Hawkeye Tyrannosaurus Rex Venom. Must drive faster, must drive faster. Old Man Logan is an insanely graphic and fresh take on the Marvel Universe. It is set in a post-apocalyptic America where the villains of the Marvel Universe coordinated a simultaneous attack on the heroes orchestrated by none other than Red Skull. There's a gang of industrious hulks, a giant skeleton of Loki crushed by the Baxter building, old versions of superheroes and supervillains. Oh, and the Venom symbiote bonded with a frickin' T-Rex. After only showing up for a brief moment in the Old Man Logan storyline, Venom Rex instantly became a fan favorite character, which is good because it meant that we got to see how this came to be. At the beginning of the Old Man Hawkeye story, Clint Barton defends Jebediah Hammer from a gang made up of the multi-generational duplicates of multiple men. After Clint quickly disposes of all but one of the multiple men, the remaining man, I guess, ran into a puddle of the Venom symbiote, which bonded to him, and over time created an army of Venoms. After hunting down Clint to Cape Bishop Sanctuary, the two led the Venom army into the wilds, where a T-Rex from the Savage Land attacked the symbiote. Now, if you read Old Man Logan, you know that this is the exact symbiote that attacked Old Man Logan and Hawkeye. I haven't seen whether this iteration of the character has appeared later on though, although I know that he was defeated by Black Bolt. Let me know in the comments. Number 4, Mangaverse Venom. So I'm just gonna warn you now, this is a little confusing. So basically, there are two Venoms in these stories. There's a human man named Venom, and then there's the Venom symbiote, which is his normal black goopy self hidden inside an ambulance. They're both bad news bears, or spiders. 
I guess. The dude Venom is actually the son of Aunt May and her first husband, which makes it a little more heartbreaking when he kills his stepdad, Sensei Uncle Ben, and almost all the other members of the Spider Clan. He doesn't do this for no reason though. See, Venom is the enforcer of Kingpin, but as a member of the Spider School, he refuses to kill Peter. It's only when Peter goes to avenge Ben's death that they fight. Peter being overwhelmed by ninjas until he learns the true way of the spider and beats all of them, almost defeating Venom until Peter spares him. Venom cripples the kingpin and takes over the city's ninja gangs. He later comes into contact with the symbiote Venom and uses it to actually save Peter, sacrificing his own life, but then randomly shows up later looking more Venom-like and becomes Peter's teacher? So many mixed signals with this guy. Hey guys, before we get onto the top three, I just wanted to say thanks for joining us. We can't really do this without your support. If you could just leave a little like and a subscribe if you liked this video, that would really help us out. All right, let's get out to the top three. Number three, what if Spider-Man rejected the spider venom? One of many what if stories that involve Spider-Man and the goopy hunger monster. In this one shot issue, Peter rejects the chance to rise again in a new spider form after being killed and leaves his body and spirit separated. This leaves his body as free real estate for venom. The suit abandons its host, Mac Gargan, and rushes once again to be with its first long lost love. The symbiote fully bonds with Peter, turning him into a new New violent monster called poison get it because venom is turned into poison poison longs for a companion and maybe it's Peter's subconscious desires but he goes for Mary Jane after poison defeats the Avengers Mary Jane offers her body but not her soul to both prevent any further harm to others and to make poison's life as miserable as possible this hurts poison's feelings and he says screw that and he runs off Instead, he digs up the grave of Gwen Stacy and cocoons her, turning her into another symbiote similar looking to Carnage. Number 2. Spider-Man 2099 Venom The Earth of Spider-Man 2099 is awesome. Cyberpunk themes, President Doom, a seriously flawed Miguel O'Hara as Spider-Man with that awesome suit. It shouldn't be any surprise that the Venom of 2099 is just as awesome. The Venom symbiote in this world has been around for a long, long time, evolving to have new abilities like acid, blood, and spit. This version of the symbiote bonded itself to Kron Stone, the son of Tyler Stone, and the elder half-brother of Miguel O'Hara. The symbiote first appeared when it tries to kill Tyler in the hospital, and that is when Spider-Man intervenes. The fight goes on for a long time, like, like several issues long. Venom even kills Spider-Man's former lover, Dana. After Miggy learned of Venom's weakness to sound, sonic sounds were emitted all over the city, stunning Venom and allowing Spider-Man to beat him, revealing Krom's identity. Later, the symbiote would merge with Roman the Submariner and flee into the ocean. Number one, Spider-Man Rain Venom. Okay, please just pause this video. Please go read the story if you can. It's it's good, okay? Gave me goosebumps. Set 30 years after the modern Spider-Man stories, with a retired old man version of Peter Parker, Spider-Man Reigns Venom is hiding in plain sight. He has donned the identity of Edward Sachs, the age of the current New York mayor, and has been quietly pulling the strings from within. A Venom with a mind like this. He's recreated himself multiple times, became the new leader of the Sinister Six, and has installed a security system around New York to stop anyone from leaving. He has goons that walk the streets. He's a criminal mastermind because he's upset at Peter for leaving. He's upset with him for abandoning the responsibility of Venom. The Sinister Six is defeated by bombs set up by Sandman. Venom is assumed to be defeated, but this guy is tenacious, so who knows for sure. Number 10, Kane Parker. Kane was one of the first evil clones ever made of Spider-Man. And really, he wasn't evil of his own choosing. He was kind of just a bad dude because he was so defective and was quickly degenerating. His degeneration made Kane somewhat insane and his powers also didn't help. His own version of Spider-Sense was more precognitive, giving him visions of the future. The problem? With each vision he viewed, he would become more and more unhinged. Kane Parker would start out as being more of a sinister figure, but as time went on, he'd really become more of a moody anti-hero in the comics. In some cases, he was also only originally an antagonist because his motives were misunderstood by Peter. Number 9. The Jackal At one point, another clone, who was previously considered to be one of the best clones with the most potential for good, also turned to the dark side. Yes, this clone was none other than Ben Riley. Having recalled all of his deaths from when Miles was experimenting on Ben in an attempt to perfect the cloning process, Ben became somewhat 
unhinged. He ended up defeating and killing Miles Warren, only to bring him back as a clone and convince Miles to work for him. This would result in Ben adopting the mantle of the Jackal for himself and building a clone army of Spider-Man's previously dead friends, allies, and even villains, as well as building the new U Technologies Corporation. In exchange for the clones' cooperation, Ben provided them with pills that would help to stave off the degeneration while he worked to perfect the cloning process himself, and a frequency technology that would substitute the pill for, well, likely only a chosen few, because Ben probably wanted to control the other clones. He was like, I'm good, but also I'm kind of controlling you. Well, he meant well, when Peter was approached to join the Jackal, who was revealed to him to be Ben, he simply refused, believing that the Jackal was a perfect example of having all the power, but none of the responsibility. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want another list like it where we talk about even more evil Spider-Men, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. There are surprisingly a lot of evil Spider-Men out there. Number 8, Ghost Spider. While redeemed in the end, initially when we met Peter Parker, who was to become Ghost Spider, we would learn of just how evil he was. Ghost Spider is the Peter Parker from Reality Earth 11618, where he was previously known as simply the Amazing Spider. Not to be confused with Ghost Spider, who is Gwen Stacy from an alternate reality. I think that's Earth 65. So now there's kind of two Ghost Spiders. But anyways, this version of Ghost Spider makes an appearance in the 2011 ASM Annual, Annual number 38. Here we learn what happens when Uncle Ben does not die, but instead gets to live out his life alongside his nephew. He ends up teaching Peter that with great power comes a great responsibility to keep said power. As a result, he ends up training Peter, who eventually not only becomes a successful hero, but also a successful businessman and a successful scientist. Uncle Ben and Peter decide to use their scientific knowledge to lure other Spider-Men from the multiverse to their reality, and then drain them of their power to be used to booster or bolster the Amazing Spider's own abilities and powers, making him even more powerful with each transfer. However, the Spider-Man of Earth 616, when caught in this trap, was able to convince the Amazing Spider that what he was doing was pretty wrong. In the end, he sacrificed his own powers and life to help the Spider-Man of 616 escape. However, he didn't actually die, but ended up in a coma, with his soul trapped in hell. Eventually, he would awaken and return as Ghost spider. Redemption, baby. Number 7. Poison. Poison is the alternate version of Peter Parker who comes from the what if version of the other story. In this version of the story, Peter abandons the spider within himself. This leaves Peter detached and vulnerable. Sensing this, the Venom symbiote leaves its then host, Matt Gargan, in pursuit of Peter Parker, who is still within his cocoon. The symbiote forcibly bonds with Peter and emerges from the cocoon as a new entity that goes by the name of Poison. Instinctively returning to Mary Jane, it then attempts to convince her to join its side. But terrified of what both the symbiote and what Peter have become, she rejects them. Ultimately, they decide to dig up the body of Gwen Stacy and make her their new partner in crime. Yikes. Poison is all around just bad news. Very, very evil. Very spooky. Not that all spooky things need to be evil, just to be clear. Coming in at number six, we have the infamous Iron Patriot, aka Norman Osborn. Best known as being the alter ego of Spider-Man's nemesis, the Green Goblin, Norman Osborn has long been one of the biggest threats in the Marvel Universe, manipulating events from afar as the CEO of Oscorp. Following the invasion of Earth by the Skrull army, Norman found himself suddenly in the public eye and with goodwill after being the one to personally defeat the Skrull Queen. Norman would use this influence to lead the Dark Avengers as the Iron Patriot, a twisted version of Iron Man combined with Captain America's patriotism that tricked the public into trusting Norman and showing that Tony Stark is definitely not the worst billionaire in the Marvel world. Coming in at number 5, we have the Iron Maniac. On the dark alternate world of Earth 5012, most of the superheroes of this reality are dead after an unknown fatal error made by Reed Richards. A vengeful and violent Tony Stark makes it his life's mission to get revenge on Reed and modifies his armor to resemble that of Reed's worst enemy, Doctor Doom. This insane version of Iron Man killed the Human Torch and was eventually banished to the main Marvel Universe where he had to be subdued by the combined efforts of Spider-Man Captain America, and Black Widow, who found it a bit unnerving to be fighting such a far-gone version of one of their closest allies. This Tony was just as resourceful as the real one, however, as he'd even escaped custody by building a new suit from the remains of a life model decoy. Pretty resourceful for an insane Iron Man. Coming in at number 4, we have the Superior Iron Man. 
During an event known as Axis, many Marvel heroes and villains had their morality completely inverted, with good guys becoming bad, bad guys becoming good, and so on and so forth. One of the few changes that wasn't reversed by the end of the event, however, was the morality of Iron Man, who in his evil form still possessed all of the intelligence and dark aspects of Tony's personality, and managed to build a shield for himself to prevent being turned into a hero again infecting much of the planet with a new version of the extremis virus, and using artificially intelligent drones to assert his dominance, this version of Tony was only finally cured by the Marvel Universe's collapse into battle world resetting his morals, meaning that this was a villain that the rest of the Avengers didn't even manage to properly defeat. Coming in at number three, we have Obadiah Stane, aka the Iron Monger in the very first Iron Man film. It's become a bit of a meme at this point, that many of the supervillains of the MCU are dark reflections of the same powers and personalities as the heroes they're opposing, and the Iron Monger is the origin of that trope in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Completely guilt-free about selling weapons to all sides, Stane is a ruthless businessman willing to do anything to maintain control of Stark Industries, and shows just how awful Tony's new technology could be used in the wrong hands, and what a monster he could become if he gave up on his deepest morals. Although, honestly, the fact that his idea of upgrading the Iron Man suit is just to make the original one bigger, maybe he's not quite as smart as Tony after all. Coming in at number two, we have the evil Emperor Stark. Hailing from the destroyed world of Earth 42777, this version of Iron Man was perhaps the cruelest the multiverse had ever seen, as he manipulated Magneto and the Brotherhood of Mutants into declaring war on humanity, then used the resulting anti-mutant backlash to secure power as the world's only superhero. Holding entire countries hostage with natural disasters and even spreading plagues among his own citizens, this version of Tony declared himself Emperor Stark, taking the cloak of Doctor Doom as a final trophy. This was Iron Man at his most evil, and he was an incredibly powerful threat when encountered by the multiverse-traveling Exiles, only eventually defeated by his own universe's last superhero survivor, Sue Storm. A tragic end for a tragic villain. And finally, coming in at our top spot, we have Zombie Iron Man. When Earth-2149 was first hit by the zombie plague that's since been highlighted in multiple Marvel spin-off series, this version of Iron Man attempted to use teleportation technology to escape to a different universe with Nick Fury. However, a zombified Fantastic Four arrived too quickly for this plan, and Tony was bitten, becoming a living corpse inside his metal armor and developing a bloodlust and pure hunger for human flesh. Still surviving even after having his legs legs blasted off by the Silver Surfer, the zombified Iron Man would go on to lead the rest of the undead heroes and villains in an attack against Galactus and gain this universe's power cosmic, meaning he could now pursue more flesh throughout the entire universe and bring the zombie plague to the rest of the doomed cosmos. Starting off in at number 10, Black Flash. The actual physical representation of death for all speedsters, Black Flash is the Grim Reaper of the Speed Force, making his first appearance in the Flash Vault Volume 2 and number 138 back in 1998, he was seen before the deaths of several speedsters, including Barry Allen, Johnny Quick, and Bart Allen. But he also tried to return Wally West to the Speed Force, but was unsuccessful, taking Linda Park instead, Wally's girlfriend. Black Flash eventually did return to try to claim Wally again, freezing time for everyone without a connection to the Speed Force to do so, but thanks to the combined efforts of multiple speedsters, Wally was able to race Black Flash until the end of time, causing death to have no meaning. The CW Black Flash, which was really just Hunter's Zolomon, aka Zoom, was killed during Season 3 when Savitar lured him out of the Speed Force and then Killer Frost froze him, resulting in her first kill that actually turned out to be her ex as well. <laughs> Dare I say, ice cold. But that didn't stop the Speed Force anyway, since later on, Barry Allen returned in the Flash Rebirth storyline in the comics, becoming the new Black Flash. So this is also a version of the original Flash, as well as a separate entity. In at 9, Inertia. The bitter feud between the Allen family and the Thawne family would span generations, even in the 30th century 
century, President Thon sought to recruit Bart Allen in his revenge campaign against the Allens, since Bart was half Thon himself. When that failed, Thon mixed Bart's DNA with Thon's genetic material to create a speedster clone who he named Thaddeus Thon. Whereas Bart grew in a hyper accelerated world, Thaddeus's childhood was the exact opposite, because of course it was, he's the reverse. His development was super slow, which led the young speedster to become more calculated and methodical. Thaddeus was also taught to hate the Allen family, and Impulse in particular. In addition to this modification, Thaddeus's growth and development was slowed. This is in contrast to Bart's accelerated development. However, after killing Bart, Wally West had other plans. Upon hearing of Bart's death, an enraged Flash hunted Inertia down. Though he thought of killing him, Flash decided instead to do something worse. He used his abilities to slow Inertia's movements down to the point where he was totally immobile, essentially a living statue, and then he placed Inertia on display at the Flash Museum, facing statues of Bart Allen as Impulse and Kid Flash. He could still think, see, and hear in normal time, but was frozen in place. Inertia was then just doomed to spend an eternity in a state of near total paralysis, staring at images of the guy he killed. In a day, Godspeed. August Hart is the former detective partner of Barry Allen. August was the only witness to Barry's accident that turned him into the Flash, and while going after a criminal organization called the Black Hole, August was struck by lightning during a speed force storm in Central City. August became the ruthless vigilante known as Godspeed, and got his revenge on the man who he suspected to have killed his brother. He had given up on the justice system since his brother's killer had gone free and, with his newfound power, had the ability to become judge, jury, and executioner. August realized after he had gotten his powers that he also had the ability to steal others' speed, though for a time he could only do it by killing them. He practiced this skill to be able to do it non-lethally as well though. With his new godlike speed, August was able to move so fast as to create duplicates of himself at any given time, allowing him to give the illusion that he and Godspeed were different people, which is pretty damn sick, considering the alternatives are Speed Mirage and Time Remnant, which aren't exactly the same thing, but are still fairly similar. And in 7, Earth X. There is little known about the Earth X version of Barry Allen. Known as Blitzkrieg in this reality, he's a fascist version of the Flash working alongside Dark Arrow and Overgirl, the Oliver Queen and Kara zor of Earth X, who are also married, but that's a story for another day. In the Arrow vs. Crisis on Earth X crossover, Earth X Barry is actually nowhere to be seen. Instead, he's replaced by Reverse Flash, the Eobard Thawne of Earth 1. Even though on the animated show The Ray, which takes place on Earth X, there is a fascist Barry, so what happened? It's largely assumed that between his last appearance in the show and in the crossover, that Thawne arrived and took his chance to kill at least a version of Barry, even if it wasn't his own. Hence why the other Earth Xers were so trusting of Thawne, since he had bested their Barry. I don't know how this Barry got his powers without the particle accelerator, but what I do know is that even the Joker refused to work with the Red Skull when he realized that he was actually a fascist and not some kook in a wildly inappropriate costume, saying that he may be a psychopath, but he's an American psychopath, or something along those lines. So, Reverse Flash is worse than Joker confirmed. Like, this wasn't even a Reverse Flash who was raised in the fascist life. He just wanted to help out, which is messed up as hell. Number 6, Ultimatum. Ultimatum is an evil alternate version of Hero and Spider-Man Miles Morales. Or really, he's the main counterpart to Miles, who hails from Earth 1610, the Ultimate Universe. Ultimatum is the version of Miles that existed on Earth 616, his 616 counterpart. 616 Miles was a criminal who allied himself with the Kingpin, growing up and belonging to a crime family. He proved his loyalty to Wilson Fisk and was permitted by the Kingpin to later on retire because he was so loyal. However, after his wife died, he decided to do what Kingpin himself had ultimately decided against when it came to his dead wife, Vanessa, to find an alternate version of her in the multiverse who was alive so that he could reunite with her. Miles ended up in the reality of Earth 1610 as a result. Eventually, he would return to Earth 616, only to find that Miles of 1610 had emigrated there. Ultimatum at this point decided to set things right and planned to send Miles and his family back to 1610, taking back his rightful place as the Miles Morales of 616, and aiming to become a prominent criminal and villain in New York thereafter. Number 5. Slim. Recently, Miles Morales got his own clone saga in his series Miles Morales Spider-Man. It turned out that the assessor had made clones of Miles after capturing and studying him. This batch of clones was unstable and after escaping were on the hunt to find a cure using any means necessary. Salim was sort of like the leader among them and he ended up at odds with Spider-Man Miles and Spider-Man Peter. Due to being raised while rapidly aging by the assessor, Salim and his brothers were kind 
kind of messed up and kind of misguided and kind of evil. They inherently struck out at Miles and Peter when the two groups of Spider-Men crossed one another's paths. After Miles mistook their found cure for a serum to make more clones and ended up destroying it, Salim decided to kidnap Miles' baby sister, Billy, in order to lure Miles to him. With only a few hours left to live, Salim wanted to face Miles, hoping to prove that he had successfully been created to be the superior version of him, despite being otherwise unstable and effective. As so many clones have been, and often are. Number 4. Craven the Hunter It's not just Doc Ock who's taking a swing at web-slinging when it comes to Spider-Man's rogues gallery. Craven also once decided to step into Peter's shoes and become Spider-Man for a short time. This was during Craven's last hunt, when Craven seemingly had killed Peter and then took his place to prove that he was the better between the two. Craven's approach to heroics was even more brutal in my opinion than Otto's, with many villains ending up fatally injured after Craven attempted to get rid of them. In the end, it was revealed that Spider-Man wasn't actually dead, but had simply been given a drug to put him in a hibernation-like state after Craven had disposed of him. Eventually, he was able to rise from the grave and return only to find out that Craven had been making a mess of the Spider-Man mantle by adopting it in his absence. Craven would end up basically surrendering content with his last hunt, believing that he'd accomplished everything he had set out to do in his life. This story and Craven's time as Spider-Man ends with him taking his own life. But don't worry, this is comics, so of course Craven would be back. Number three, Pestilence. Pestilence hails from an alternate AOA, Age of Apocalypse reality, the reality of Earth 5701. Here, Spider-Man ends up being chosen to become one of Apocalypse's four horsemen of death. He takes on the role of Pestilence and this much more evil version of the character, allied with mutant super villain Apocalypse also really looks the part too. He has fangs, which are poisonous, and six arms, really looking more like a Spider-Man than most of his heroic counterparts typically do. Here, Peter was actually chosen to become one of Apocalypse's four horsemen because he was considered so inherently good at heroics and a, as a person, I imagine. Apocalypse chose heroes he identified as the best among them to become his horsemen in this reality. Number two, Spider Doppelganger. The Doppelganger, or more specifically, the Spider Doppelganger, or the Spider-Man doppelganger, if you want, was originally an enemy created by the Magus during the Infinity War event. He was one of the many evil doppelgangers created to fight against the superhero community, which opposed Magus in the conflict. Although, like many of the other doppelgangers, the Spider-Man doppelganger would die during Infinity War. He wouldn't stay dead, though, as so many of the other doppels had. Instead, Spider Doppelganger ended up being resurrected by Demogoblin and would end up joining with him for a time, acting as his sidekick and being treated kind of like his pet. Spider Doppelganger would also go on to team up with such villainous spider enemies as Carnage and Shriek. In fact, he'd actually become for a time very close and loyal to Shriek, who treated him as though he were her own son. Number 1. Norman Osborn On the reality of Earth 44145 lives a version of Norman Osborn who becomes imbued with spider-like powers and abilities. Of course, this being Norman, he decides to use said power in his pursuit of more power, not inherently being the hero type. Peter Parker, who used to work for Norman, reveals his plan to Norman's son and Peter's friend Harry in a letter. This leads to Peter's death, which in turn motivates Harry to fight his father. Norman Osborn as Spider-Man would go on to team up with Superior Spider-Man and Spider's Man briefly during the Spider-Geddon event, but would end up partnered solely with Spider's Man after suggesting that to defeat the Inheritors, they simply trap them on our 616. Obviously, as that was Superior Spider-Man's home world, he was not really down for this plan. Number 10, Lord Iron. Although by the end, the Iron Man of Earth 311, the 602 universe, becomes a hero, he spends a lot of time being a reluctant and at times kind of full-blown antagonist. Here, Tony Stark is known as Anthony Stark, or Lord Iron. He was forced to build weapons by his captors and needs an iron suit to survive, which is powered by lightning. He is initially at odds with the Hulk, who as David Banner showed great cruelty to Stark. As such, Lord Iron became more an agent of vengeance, obsessed with getting revenge on the Hulk. By the end of his story, however, he begrudgingly agreed to stop his quest for vengeance and forgave the Hulk for how he treated him before when he was simply David Banner. So it all works out in the end, but this figure was definitely a pretty dark and somewhat evil version of Iron Man to begin with. Number 9. The Stark 
The Stark are like a whole alien race of alternate Tony Starks. They are a civilization that was literally shaped by Tony's tech after an alternate version of him decided to launch all his weapons and tech into space rather than let it fall into the hands of the evil Martians who were invading Earth at the time. Obviously, he didn't think very far ahead as to that plan, as all his tech crash landed on another alien planet where it was eventually discovered and utilized by the beings who lived there. They built their whole civilization around it, believing everyone on the planet should have their own suit of technologically advanced armor. This caused them to deplete their planet's resources and left it heavily polluted in the wake of their massive tech boom. Eventually, this drove them to ransacking and invading other planets for their resources, bringing about the same problems their own homeworld suffered to each new planet that they conquered. Note to self, don't just shoot your problems out into space. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists like it where we talk about evil alternates, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Or if you want more Iron Man lists. I don't know, maybe you like Iron Man, you want more Iron Man lists, let us know. Number 8, Steel Corpse. Steel Corpse is a complex character who has moments of both heroism and villainy in Age of X. He exists on the earth of 11326. Here Tony took the name Steel Corpse after being exposed to a virus, which permanently bonded him to his suit. Now dead within the suit, but able to move around because of being bonded to it, Tony made a darkly humorous joke calling himself the Steel Corpse, and the name just stuck. Pun not intended, but stuck, bonded. Mm. The villainous side of this dark hero comes from when he fought against the mutants with his fellow Avengers at Fortress X. However, it turned out that the Avengers were just somewhat misguided in their mission. Once they realized what they were doing was wrong, they attempted to help the mutants, although Steel Corpse was unable to make himself stop attacking. An emergency override stepped in to prevent Tony from fighting with the mutants, and so he asked Captain America to take him off the board in order to save the young mutants that his armor was threatening. Sad story. There's so many tragic Iron Mans actually. Top 10 tragic alternate versions of Iron Man is also something we could do. Number 7, Strange 2099. Another alternate version of Strange who meant well, but who at times was kind of corrupted. This time, not so much by her own trauma like the ultimate Dr. Stephen Strange Sr., but instead by external demonic forces. More specifically, a literal demon who she was possibly tricked into sharing a body with. This version of Dr. Strange that we are talking about here is known simply as Genie. She hails from the reality of Earth 928, aka the Marvel Futuristic 2099 universe. While for the most part the demon within Genie doesn't cause too many problems, at one point it does fully take over her body, making at least her physical form evil for a time, until she is freed by 2099's Moon Knight wielding the Soul Sword. Moon Knight in 2099 is also pretty cool. Lots of cool 2099 characters. We have lists for that, by the way, if you're interested in the 2099 universe. Number 6, Loki Sorcerer Supreme. Loki ended up tricking Doctor Strange for a time out of his title becoming the Sorcerer Supreme in his place instead. He did this with mm, somewhat good intentions, believing he was better prepared and suited to the role of Sorcerer Supreme and could protect Earth against threats that Strange himself seemed unprepared to face. Basically, Loki felt that Strange wasn't willing to break enough rules to be Sorcerer Supreme and Loki was like, I could do that, so I'm gonna take this job for the better of the world for the better of the world. However, the fact remains that Loki still tricked Steven, didn't come by the artifacts associated with or the powers of the title fairly, and is often known for being eh, more a villain than a hero in the comics. While Loki took up Strange's place, Steven was forced to become a veterinarian in the interim, which is actually pretty cute. I gotta say, the idea of Doctor Strange as like a pet doctor, it's it's pretty great. Also, this is where Bats, the talking and now ghostly Basset hound comes from, if you were wondering. So we got that out of this story arc, which is pretty great. Number 5, Doctor Strange Fate. While not inherently evil, Doctor Strange Fate did attempt to sacrifice both the DC Universe and Marvel Universe just to keep the Amalgam Universe alive. This made him a villain of Marvel's Doctor Strange, whose own world was actually threatened by his plot. Doctor Strange battled Strange Fate and won, despite him on paper being a stronger version of the two 
being part Charles Xavier, part Doctor Strange, and part Doctor Fate from DC. However, Strange pitied Strange Fate and the Amalgam Universe and allowed them to continue on but within a pocket dimension, safely in case so they could not threaten the other universes. Number 4. Leader of the Black Priests The Black Priests aren't necessarily evil so much in the way that you know, they don't they don't do things just for the sake of being bad. They are more on the side of good, but they are willing to do whatever it takes to protect the multiverse, which can make them pretty bad and pretty evil at times, especially when dealing with issues like incursions. Steven, in a reality that no longer exists but is still part of his main continuity story, albeit somewhat of a tangent considering the present continuity, ended up becoming the leader of the Black Priests and as such joined them in destroying entire alternate Earths, believing he was doing what was right. Still, I feel like if you were destroying entire worlds, even it's for the greater good, you you probably need to like re-examine your alignment. Be like, maybe there's a better way to do this. Number three, Zombie Doctor Strange. Zombies are almost always evil, and Doctor Strange is not an exception to that standard, as we see when he becomes a zombie in the Marvel Zombies universe. This version of Steven hails from the reality of Earth 2149, sometimes referred to as Earth Z. We don't know how Steven became a zombie, but before that happened, he was one of the few last standing survivors to join Nick Fury in his fight against the invasion as we see him present during Fury's speech on the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier, where Fury has rallied together some surviving heroes and villains to help battle against the army of undead. In the end, however, Strange 2 becomes a zombie, and from there, he ends up developing and satiating his taste for human flesh and brains. Number 2. Doctor Strange Supreme Of course, we have to talk about this alternate version, the one I mentioned in the intro. This is one of the most evil versions of Doctor Strange we've seen to date. He appears in the What If series episode number 4, What If Doctor Strange Lost His Heart Instead of His Hands. In this episode, Strange becomes evil after losing his love Christine, instead of losing the mobility of his hands. After becoming Sorcerer Supreme, he thinks about a way to bring her back and ends up becoming obsessed with finding some way to alter the timeline to make it so that Christine is able to stay alive. Even after learning from the Ghost of the Ancient One that Christine's death is unavoidable, as it is an absolute point in time. The Ancient One warns that to change this point in history would actually lead to the destruction of the universe. Still, Strange is not dissuaded. He ends up, or part of him at least ends up, at the library of Cagliostro and learns that to break an absolute point in time, he needs to absorb creatures which will basically grant him more power. Basically he just needs more power, so he's like, I'm gonna summon all these powerful creatures and I'm gonna suck up their power. Eventually, his actions do lead to the destruction of his universe, and he ends up all alone, trapped there, despite his pleas to the Watcher to help him fix the universe as it unravels. But you know the Watcher, the Watcher's like, hey man, I just watch, except for the times when I do get involved, because that does happen. <laughs> Happens in that show, too. Number 1. Disciple of Dormammu This alternate version of Doctor Strange is probably the one that inspired the MCU Doctor Strange Supreme, at least in part. He hails from the reality of 791218, as seen in the 1977 What If series in issue number 18, where we answer the question, what if Doctor Strange were a disciple of Dormammu? And obviously this has happened a few times in the comics. Here Strange joins Dormammu after Baron Mordo is the one to heal his hands, using the dark magics of Dormammu also being his disciple. Strange ends up joining with Dormammu and fighting against the Ancient One and their followers, even going on to kill the man who healed him, Baron Mordo, after Dormammu reveals that he only actually needs one disciple and basically he chooses Strange, who he has deemed to be the superior of the two. This version of Steven gives me major Sith Lord vibes all in all. You know you're evil when you're giving off Sith Lord vibes. Number 10. Symbiote Spider-Man Well technically still 616 Peter Parker, Symbiote Spider-Man Man could be considered an alternate in the sense that it was a very specific version of Peter or a very specific time in his life where he took to using more brutal and violent tactics to deal with criminals. This was of course brought upon by the alien symbiote who had bonded to Peter and who he had mistaken for just being a new suit initially. Eventually Spider-Man in his black suit realized that the suit itself was alive and had kind of taken him over. He fought hard, sought out help, and would eventually become separated from the suit who otherwise did not wish to 
believe him. In so doing, Spider-Man would unwillingly create an even worse villain in Venom. At least, initially. Venom might be a hero now, but of course he did not start out that way, instead being a determined and relentless enemy to Spider-Man in his early years in the comics, who also sometimes was prone to cannibalistic tendencies and threats. Number 9. Superior Spider-Man Superior Spider-Man is an alternate version of Spider-Man who actually hails from the reality of Earth 616 as well. Superior Spider-Man was the name given to Otto Octavius' version of Spider-Man, which came about after a plot to steal Spider-Man's body was successful. Otto's body was failing, and so he decided to live on by swapping bodies with Peter Parker, which meant that Peter's consciousness ended up dying in Otto's failing body, while Otto's consciousness got to live on inside Peter's young and healthy bod. However, Peter managed to convince Otto to be a hero before he passed away, and so Otto set out to do so, aiming to be a better hero even than Peter had been. Of course, Octavius in the end wasn't really cut out for heroics, although he did do his best. He struggled at times with making the right choices and was also prone to doling out more severe forms of punishment for villains and using more sinister methods when it came to keeping the streets safe. In the end, he chose to relinquish the title and body back to Peter, who still managed to live on via his subconscious, which still remained attached to his original body. And friends, if you are loving this list and you want more lists like it, be sure to let us know by smashing that like button. I mean, there's definitely a lot of evil Spider-Man out there, so I'm pretty sure we could keep going with this one. Number 8. The CEO In an alternate 2099 reality, we see explored in the video game Spider-Man Edge of Time, Peter-Man actually ends up being the big villain. In this reality, Peter goes on to become the CEO of Alchemax. His goal was noble, but uh, kind of selfish and also kind of messed up. He hoped to use time gateway technology to channel quantum energy and bring back the lives of all of those that he'd lost. In in this reality, Peter Parker was still Spider-Man, but either faked his death or just let everyone believe he had died so he could work behind the scenes as Alchemex's CEO, getting everything in place so that he could eventually put his own plan into motion. This version of Peter ends up getting erased from time after Miguel O'Hara's Spider-Man beats him up and manages to basically reset young Peter's story, thereby convincing Peter to never become the CEO of Alchemex and preventing this evil future self from ever existing. Number 7. Asset 42 Asset 42 42 was likely one of the first clones ever made by the assessor of Miles Morales. This clone was considered to be a burner clone and only lasted a few issues. But what a roller coaster of a ride those few issues he appeared in were. This evil version of Miles Morales first appeared in issue 17 of the Miles Morales Spider Man series, and shortly thereafter perished in a fight against Miles. Miles seemingly kills Asset 42 in this fight, but in reality, the clone was revealed to have only really been made to last for uh, about a day. So it's highly likely that even without fighting Miles, he would have just died as he was already breaking down and basically turning into liquid-like goo, as is evident in his final fight against the original one and only Miles Morales. Asset 42 was in league with Ultimatum and helped to kidnap the real Miles for that villain. Number 6. Zombie Colonel America What's worse than a werewolf cap? A zombie cap, obviously. This is the version of Captain America that we get in the Marvel Zombie first. Although really, this isn't Captain America as a zombie, it's Colonel America, because that is Steve Rogers' hero mantle in this reality. Here, Colonel America was infected and turned into a zombie during that first confrontation with the zombified Sentry, which the Avengers responded to in downtown New York. Zombie Cap was responsible for turning Spider-Man into a zombie, biting him after he himself was infected. He was one of the zombies to fight against the villains for who should get the remains of Galactus's corpse, and of course with it, the power cosmic, which would enable them to travel to other worlds, which they then could devour. However, zombie Zombie Cap was defeated by his nemesis, a zombified Red Skull. So no power cosmic for him. He dead. He he's double dead. Really. Number 5. William Burnside William Burnside was the Captain America of the 1950s, who ended up being retconned to not actually be Steve Rogers at all, although he was a man who believed he was Steve Rogers. This version of Captain America was later revealed to be William Burnside initially, a man who was hired to replace Captain America after he went missing in World War II. This version of Captain America was racist and extremely anti-communist, echoing the McCarthy communist witch hunts of those times. Burnside illegally changed his name to Steven Rogers and would have an extended lifespan thanks to a version of the super soldier serum that he was exposed to. However, because this was not a perfected version of the serum, it apparently would also cause him to become more extreme over time as his psyche and mind degraded as a result, so made him pretty crazy and pretty evil. 
Number 4 Evil Clone An evil clone with the mind of Red Skull. To be honest, this has happened multiple times in the comics, where Red Skull has ended up having his consciousness, his personality, or his memories, or some combination of those, into the clone of Steve Rogers. It's happened both in the main continuity and in alternate universes. For this version though, we're going to be talking about issue 350 of Captain America, where the Red Skull in Steven Rogers' clone body ends up being the mastermind behind the whole commission slash walker kerfuffle that we talked about earlier on on this list. His plan this time around in a Steve Steve Rogers' clone body is to discard his previous ideologies and use capitalism itself to dismantle the democracy of America and destroy the nation from the inside out. It doesn't work out in the end, and the issue ends with him facing off against both John Walker and the captain and becoming deformed once more by the red dust of death. But he did try it. He did try. And don't worry, he would come back in um, more clone bodies. That's how he do. Number 3 Vampire King This version of Captain America comes from the Exile series where he becomes King of the Vampires. In the alternate reality of Earth 3931 during World War II by Baron Blood. Baron Blood turns him into a vampire. Vampire Cap is definitely not a good dude, likely the most evil of all the monstrous Captain Americas listed here. This version of Captain America has his own sinister version of the Avengers and Thralls, who he enlists and forces to fight for him. However, he still proves to be no match for the Exiles, who end up defeating and decapitating him in the end. Number 2 President Red Skull Not an alternate version of Steve Rogers, but an alternate version of Red Skull who beat Rogers and took to wearing his Captain America suit off and around his new redecorated Oval Office. This alternate version of Red Skull comes from the Old Man Logan universe where Red Skull ends up appointing himself the new President of the US, which he renames America. America with a K. Red Skull ends up not just defeating Captain America, but also almost all of the superhero community when he manages to rally together an impossible to defeat force of supervillains who coordinate their attack on the nation. Being that he's Red Skull, he's probably one of the most evil versions of Captain America out there because he's Red Skull. Although, like I said, he's not fully a cap alt really, but he definitely evil, so. And he does wear that suit a lot. Number 1 Hydra Supreme This alternate version of Captain America was initially retconned to be THE version of Captain America. Steven Rogers ended up being revealed as a Hydra sleeper agent in one of the biggest twists in comic book history. All his heroic actions had apparently just been Steve buying time and building trust so that he'd be in the perfect position to take over the US and could then reveal his true colors. Hail Hydra to this day is one of the most iconic lines ever uttered by the supposed hero. However, it all turned out that this version of Cap wasn't the real Steve Rogers of 616. Instead, what happened was Kobik, the sentient living version of the Cosmic Cube, was convinced by Red Skull that reality should be warped so that Cap could become an agent of Hydra. When this happened, the real heroic version of Captain America ended up trapped within a shard of the Cosmic Cube, and the now altered version of the character took his place in the reality of 616. In the end, the true Cap would be freed from the shard and would end up fighting and defeating his evil Hydra Supreme alternate version. And if you're worried, don't worry, the shard was made bigger, so it wasn't like little tiny cap running around. Number 10, Joe Fixit. I think he looks just downright adorable in that suit, but uh, his actions are definitely not adorable. Joe Fixit is essentially the Grey Hulk, which is a weaker, darker Hulk persona that resides inside Bruce's head. Joe is a trickster, he's manipulative, doesn't really care for others. He can drive a car. He has a twin pair of Tommy guns. Oh, and did I mention the suit? Because because he wears a suit. Joe Fixit Hulk took up a job as an enforcer at a casino, which is where all of this mafioso business came from. And he stayed this way for several months, not reverting back into Bruce for the duration of this period. He even had a relationship at this time, like a whole relationship that blossomed and peaked and ended. Mr. Fixit came to an end eventually, thanks to the Magia. Hey, forget about it, though. We're moving on to number nine. Number nine. War Hulk. This version of Hulk came about when the mutant apocalypse promised the Hulk he would remove a piece of shrapnel that was in his brain if he became his war, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. This meant that Hulk would be imbued with the power of the celestials. That's a lot of power! As war, 
Hulk faced off against both the Absorbing Man and Juggernaut. But what he didn't know was that these two were accompanied by Rick and Janice Jones, Bruce's best and longtime friends. As Hulk was about to kill Juggernaut and the Absorbing Man, Rick jumped in the way, and Hulk got Rick instead, crippling him. The image of his friend, hurt by his own actions, caused Hulk to break of Apocalypse's influence and run away, ashamed of his actions. Number eight, Kla. Kla, which is Hulk backwards, very creative, is basically what happens when the Hulk goes Hulk. He is another one of the evil personalities inside Hulk's head. This version of Hulk has black skin with glowing red scars. He has red demonic eyes, white hair, and big talons. Claw emerges when Hulk reaches a sufficient level of rage, meaning he is more powerful than any other rage boosted version of the Green Hulk. Which is insane if you know about a certain world breaking version of the character. This version of Hulk is usually suppressed and has only shown up a few times and not for very long I might add. He appeared in the Axis storyline where heroes and villains had their morality switched. Hulk isn't exactly always a good guy, sometimes letting his rage hurt good and bad guys. But since Klaw is his opposite, he lets his rage hurt and maim everyone, good and bad, putting even the villains on alert. Look. He just wants to bathe in the blood of the innocents. That's reasonable, right? Number seven, Cadaverous's Avengers. Cadaverous's Avengers were part machine, part man, and all influenced by the villainous Cadaverous. They show up in whatever alternate world J.J. Abrams and his son Henry Abrams Spider-Man series is relegated to. I don't think it has an official number yet. It does have a temporary reality number though. This team seemed hell bent on getting revenge on Iron Man, the only surviving Avenger left in this world. Well. Well, I guess Peter was still alive at this point, and I mean, he's normally a part of the Avengers team, at least at some point, but I mean, in terms of the standard Avengers cast, we've all come to familiarize ourselves with through various forms of media, including the films. I mean, especially the films in this case, just based on the roster. These villainous corpse versions of the former heroes face off against the old Iron Man, Iron Heart, Spider-Man's son, Ben Parker, and his powerless but enthusiastic friend and love interest, Faye Ito. Or is it Ito Faye? Needless to to say these evil counterparts at least weren't in control of themselves, but instead were being influenced by Cadaverous to fight against their former friend and colleague with the use of old Stark Tech neurochips. Number six, the Gatherers. The Gatherers are a team of former Avengers of different alternate realities who survived their world's destruction, tricked by an alternate reality Black Knight named Proctor into believing that their world's Circes were to blame. Proctor united them together and gave them a single enemy, the Circe of Earth 616. The team consisted of alternate reality versions of Proctor, Rick Jones, The Thing or Korg, Swordsman, Black Panther, and The Vision as well as some unknown original villains. But for them to carry out their vengeance, each member had to kill their Earth 616 counterpart within a certain amount of time, or they would die from cellular breakdown. What the members of the Gatherers did not know is that their leader, Proctor, was responsible for the destruction of each world they are from, as he drove that world Circe into madness, causing her to lash out and destroy everything around her, all because of a bad breakup. Damn, dude. Number five, Android Ultimates. The Android Ultimates come from Ultimates 3. They make their first appearance in issue number four of the Ultimates 3 series. This is where we first learn that these Ultimates aren't really the Ultimates at all, but replacements built by Ultron to act just like them. His plan is to use the team of robotic hero impersonators to destroy man and help the machines of the world rise up. Really all machines too. There's a weird part where they're talking about like, we as machines are just seen as these tools. Us toasters, we will unite. <laughs> It's like very strange. Of course, the Ultimates themselves will have a few things to say about that whole plan. Ultron styles himself after his father, Ant-Man, but he and his team wouldn't make it past the next issue. It would later be revealed that their leader, Ultron, wasn't actually fully in control, but instead was being puppeted by Doctor Doom. So many reveals where people are actually being controlled by someone else. Number four, Undead Avengers. The living are not welcome on Earth 666, and the world is only consisting purely of the dead. Undead or supernatural beings. Vampires, werewolves, mummies, and more all exist here, and each group is divided into separate factions. But don't fear, the greatest heroes from across these groups are assembled together to protect this world. They are 
the Undead Avengers. This team is so cool. A Captain America who never recovered from being a werewolf, a part spider Natasha Romanov, a devil daredevil, a mummified Thor the Accursed who wields the backwards Mjolnir that casts black anti-magic energy, vampire Wolverine, Where Hawkeye, Franken Castle? I mean, come on. These guys come into conflict with Captain Britain when trying to defend the orb of necromancy in order for them to spread undeath across all of reality. And they first appear in Secret Avengers number 33. Number three, Dark Avengers. The Dark Avengers technically hail from Earth 616, but they are a completely alternate team when it comes to their roster and in general their backstory and motives. Well, that is, in a way, the Dark Avengers do attempt to do good, but they are just all approaching it from a more villainous side. And many of the team members don't do good for the sake of doing good, but have their own ulterior motives. So can we really call that good? Oh, that's a philosophical question for you. The Dark Avengers were introduced when Norman Osborn was given reign over the heroic team after he'd been declared a hero for killing the Skrull Queen, Varonki. Aside from getting to build his own Avengers team, which would replace the previous one, S.H.I.E.L.D. had been disbanded and Osborn was allowed to create his own organization to replace it, using the acronym HAMMER, which really doesn't stand for anything. Osborn just thought it sounded cool, so that's not really an acronym, it's just capitalized letters at that point. He pulled together his own Avengers team, which publication-wise became known as the Dark Avengers, composed of various Marvel villains, anti-heroes, and misled heroes in some cases, or heroes who were just like really lost at the time, who Osborn united when the standard Avengers hero members refused to join his team. He did try though. <laughs> he was like, hey, Carol, come be on this team. She was like, uh, hell no. <laughs> Number two. Zombie Galacti. I think most of us are familiar with Earth 2149, which is the home of the Marvel Zombie storyline. Here, a separate reality zombie infected sentry was sent by his Earth's Watcher. The Avengers were the first on the scene and quickly died or were infected, with the rest of the population falling quickly afterwards. Once the Herald of Galactus, the Silver Surfer, showed up to announce the arrival of Galactus, he was consumed by Hulk. Wolverine, Spider-Man, Iron Man, Giant Man, Power Man, and Captain America, who absorbed his powers and used it to toast other zombies to improve their flavor. Gordon Ramsay would not approve. The zombie Galacti used the machine to unite their power cosmic to take down Galactus and, after fighting their zombie villains, consumed and absorbed his power too, using it to spread the infection throughout the whole of their universe. Number 1. Revengers The Cancerverse Avengers, known as the Revengers, hail from a reality where the world was turned upside down by the fact that death was defeated. I know, how can you kill death? Well apparently when you make deals with elder god-like beings, anything is possible. Like what happened here. In a bid to save Captain Marvel from life-threatening cancer, a deal was struck with the many angled ones. As a result, death ended up dead, which actually resulted in the whole universe becoming a perverted version of itself. You'd think without death around, the universe would become like a paradise. But no. It became rank with disease that spread and basically couldn't die, becoming known as the Cancerverse. All the heroes who remained here were made to serve the many angled ones, because becoming their loyal servants and attempting to invade other universes eventually and conquer them in the name of their Lovecraftian horror-esque gods, Avengers included or Revengers included. Number 10, Plutonian. The Plutonian hails from the Mark Wade series Irredeemable and its spin-off Incorruptible, both published by Boom Studios. In this series, we get to imagine what a Superman character would be like if he wasn't driven by hope and kindness, but instead driven by a sense of entitlement and rage. Daniel Hartigan was once a hero who did his best to earn the respect and love of the people of Earth, but has turned hard over the years, in part by the loss he himself has suffered, but also by the fact that he feels in essence betrayed by humanity who he sees as lesser and who he grows to despise for critiquing his failings. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that like button. Number 9, Centaur Superman. Yeah, Superman turns into a freaking centaur in the weird 90s comic miniseries, Whom Gods Destroy. Seriously, it's really bizarre, you should check it out. But even before Superman undergoes this transformation, I really like this alternate because it gets to explore what the world is like when it actually ages, but Kal-El does not. In this reality, Lois Lane and Lana Lang are now elderly women and have to deal with the fact that Superman hasn't really physically aged. Mentally is starting to become detached from the world as well. In comic books, we don't really have a realistic representation of the passage of time because no one is ever allowed to get old. This series explores that a bit. Then it gets really weird when we find out that Germany actually ended up winning sort of World War II and it's ruled by 
those soldiers from World War II and the god Adonis as well. Superman gets turned into an evil centaur, Lois becomes Wonder Woman, Lana becomes the Oracle of Delphi. It's strange, but it's also through the combination of mythology and comics that we get to see the characters' internal struggles reflected in the transformations that they undergo. It's just a really interesting exploration of Superman's crisis, really. And then it gets a happy ending when all three actually decide to live in a polyamorous love triangle on the moon in Superman's Fortress of Solitude. So yeah. It's not an evil centaur forever, you know? Number 8. Superboy Prime Superboy Prime originally started out as an extremely powerful villain in the comics. He became iconic after it was revealed that he was so strong that he could even warp and change reality. How? Apparently with just a punch. There was a time in the comics where Superboy Prime was shown to be so strong that he basically punched reality, splintering it, and in essence reshaping it. If Superboy Prime has the power to punch retcons into existence, what can't he do? Superboy Prime was originally corrupted and became a villain mainly because of his sense of loss, having lost his homeworld. However, over time, he would actually be redeemed and even fight alongside other heroes in the comics, which is why I've ranked him so low here. Although when he was evil and entitled, he was really, really evil and entitled, which also made him one of the most frightening Superman alternates. Number 7. Gregory Stark Gregory Stark is the evil twin brother of Antonio Stark, aka a Iron Man in the Ultimate Universe of Earth 1610. Initially, Gregory Stark just seems like a better version of Tony. He's smarter, more focused, and is willing to cross lines in order to get a job done that Tony probably wouldn't cross. Sure, he's more morally ambiguous when it comes to his initiative, but on paper, he's more morally conscious when it comes to his lifestyle. However, that of course lends well to him being revealed as a villain in the Ultimate Universe. While he never takes up the mantle of Iron Man, Gregory is Antonio's twin brother in this universe. He also employs nanotech like Tony does here and attempts to use it to defeat the Ultimates and Avengers, including his brother Tony. However, Tony ends up defeating his twin brother by sending out an EMP, which disrupts his tech, making him vulnerable to Thor's attack. Number 6. Iron Man 2099 Or one of the 2099 Iron Mans, anyways. This version that we're talking about here hails from the animated series Iron Man Armored Adventures. He appeared in season 2 in the episode titled Iron Man 2099. Here Andros is Iron Man 2099 and he goes to the past in an attempt to destroy Tony Stark. Why? Well because in his future, Tony Stark, Andros' granddad, was actually responsible for bringing about the end of humanity's reign. He created an AI program built to help humanity called Vortex, but when Vortex got into the computers and escaped to check out the internet, it saw humanity as evil. I mean, if you judge us based on everything that's on the internet, I could definitely see it going that way. There's a lot of messed up stuff on the internet. Andros was the antagonist of the episode, but he thought he was actually saving the world by fighting against Tony and stopping him, when in reality he learned that Vortex was actually kind of created by Tony because of him. Time travel. It's trippy, man. In the end, Vortex is wiped from the future, and so is Andros. But at least Andros is kind of cool with it. He's like, at least Vortex is gone, so I'm good. Bye. <laughs> Bye, grandfather. Who's now not my grandfather because I don't exist. I don't know, with my former grandfather. Time travel's weird. Number 5. The First Civil War Well, you might think of Tony Stark from the First Civil War as main continuity Iron Man. He's also kind of an alternate at this point. While at the time we would consider Iron Man to be part of that main continuity, in modern day, the version of Tony we have now had the events and basically the guilt of Civil War I basically wiped from his mind. Okay, let me explain. In part 1 we touched on the events of Axis and Superior Iron Man, which happened after the first Civil War. But before this mind wipe happened, it all went down because Norman Osborn had been given the reins for America's superhero team and operation, creating Hammer. To protect all the secrets that he knew, especially in regards to superheroes names and their identities, cause Civil War 1 happened, Tony decided to wipe his mind. This had the added bonus of basically erasing the events of Civil War 1 and his misdeeds from his psyche, meaning that he was no longer really the Tony that we knew from that time. The one who had decided to, you know, round up and imprison heroes who refused to register and ally themselves with him and the government. The one who inadvertently ruined Peter's life by encouraging him to join him and ultimately causing him to publicly unmask, which 
just ruined a lot of stuff in Spider-Man. Tony also ended up in a coma for a bit as a result of this mind wipe. But you know how comas work in comics, they're pretty much always temporary. And Tony was soon once more up and at him after having an earlier backup copy of himself rebooted. <laughs> into his mind, cause you know, you can just make backup copies of your mind when you're a genius like Tony Stark. So don't worry, he had a plan for that in case that ever happened to him. Fortunately, it did happen and so they could use the plan. Thanks Pepper. Number four, Arno Stark. Arno Stark is Tony Stark's evil brother his evil brother from 616. Well, he's not always super evil, but he definitely has some questionable approaches when it comes to being Iron Man. He's like Tony, but with more questionable morals, I guess. Arno was actually the natural born son of Howard and Maria Stark. Tony would learn about Arno and also find out that he was actually the adopted son of the couple. Arno first uses the mantle of Iron Man in 2019 in the 2018 series Tony Stark Iron Man in issue number 19. Arno as Iron Man ended up in a fight with Tony Tony during the seeming robot revolution, believing that the only way to solve the issue of humans versus AI was to enslave the human population. It makes sense if you're following Arno through that story. Tony was forced to then stop his brother by trapping him in his virtual armor and placing him in a dreamlike virtual reality where he was seen as a hero. I'm sure that won't end up ending badly for Tony in years to come. Right? It's not like Donald Blake was living in a virtual reality where he was happy and then realized it was fake and then escaped and then tried to kill all the Thors or anything like that. That, that totally didn't happen, guys. Number three, infamous Iron Man. Maybe one of the most evil, but also somehow one of the best at the same time was infamous Iron Man. This was when Dr. Doom stepped up to the plate to replace Iron Man after his defeat in Civil War II, which of course left him in a comatose state. So many comas. Two figures rose up to replace Tony at that time, one being Ironheart, AKA young genius Riri Williams, and another being Dr. Doom, who became infamous Iron Man. While Ironheart was more the heroic counterpart of the two, Doom also learned more and more about what becoming a hero entailed through his journey. And while he was ruthless as Iron Man, in the end, he did kind of become a hero. However, this is still Dr. Doom we're talking about here, and eventually he left the mantle to return to Latveria and his life of villainous schemes and plots back to the old status quo. And because this is still Doctor Doom underneath the armor, I think we can count him as an evil alternate. No? Number two, Cancer vs. Iron Man. This version of Iron Man was also corrupted, though not by the controversial story arc of the 90s event, The Crossing, but instead by the many angled ones. He hails from the reality of Earth 10011. Here Iron Man became corrupted by the Cancer verse after Marvel made a deal with the many angled ones, which would cure him of his cancer. Death no longer existed in this reality, which did not bring about a paradise, but instead a hellish dimension. Iron Man became loyal to Marvel, joining his Revengers team. It was Iron Man who also defeated Hulk in this reality, capturing Quasar, aka Wendell Vaughn, who had come to this reality from Earth 616 and had been attacked by the Hulk, which is why Iron Man had to be like, no Hulk, no, taking Quasar with me. Iron Man would join his fellow Revengers in their attempt to invade Earth 616, but in the end, they would be defeated. Whew. Number 1. Darkhold Iron Man One of the darkest versions of Iron Man to ever exist at this point in comics, who starts out as an optimistic inventor and quickly becomes overtaken by his own invention, twisted, driven insane till the point when he starts to harm others with the love of his own iron suit, comes from the Darkhold Iron Man comic. Here Iron Man builds his faded suit, but realizes too late that the suit is overzealous with its protection. It doesn't just seek to protect Tony while he's inside the suit, but seeks to protect him always by kind of keeping him inside the suit. The suit heals him from the inside, but removes his skin whenever he takes parts of the suit off. Tony believes the issue is that the suit thinks iron skin is better than human skin, and so it decides to remove it. However, after compulsively putting the whole defective suit on, including the helmet, it begins to dissolve Tony's skin and then his skull as well. He basically becomes fully bonded with and reliant on the suit. Driven insane, he believes 
everyone should have an iron suit and attempts to have the whole world basically join him, including Happy, Jarvis, and his love interest and assistant in this story, Pepper Potts. It's really dark. Ah. Coming in at number 10, we have the Wild West themed Xavier Gang. In an alternate Marvel universe that bears an incredible resemblance to America in the 1800s, a band of outlaws known as the Xavier Gang are plaguing a small town in Arizona, with every mutant member of the team being individually mind controlled by a distant and diabolical version of Professor Charles Xavier. Using this team of the X-Men as puppets made up of both superheroes and supervillains, this western crook version of Xavier was only defeated once a multiverse spanning team of X-Men showed up to put an end to his mind controlling ways. Coming in at number 9, we have the bloodthirsty Vampire Wolverine. In an alternate universe where vampires have launched an all-out assault on the United States, most of the X-Men are bitten and mind controlled by the Lord of the Vampires, Dracula. Unfortunately for Dracula, however, Wolverine's healing ability allows him to regain his own mental control despite becoming a vampire, and thus is able to overthrow Dracula and become leader of the vampires. Consumed by a bloodlust that amplifies his already pretty frightening rage, Wolverine and his vampire army are able to wipe out most other superpowered life on the planet, only finally being defeated by the combined forces of Doctor Strange and the Punisher as a vampire hunting combination. Coming in at number 8, we have perhaps the most infamous X-Men palette swap with Dark Beast. Originally hailing from the alternate timeline known as the Age of Apocalypse, this version of Hank McCoy was a twisted mad scientist working under the tutelage of Mr. Sinister, striving to create the most powerful mutants possible no matter the cost. Although this messed up future would be prevented by the X-Men, Dark Beast was wily enough to find a way into the main Marvel Universe and avoid his existence being erased. Ever since, he's been a persistent thorn in the X-Men's side and a particular burden on Beast who would much rather that someone didn't use his genius for evil. Coming in at number 7, we have the possessed Shadow Professor X from Earth 6141. Isn't that a mouthful? During the event known as M-Day, when Scarlet Witch wiped out most of mutant kind, the extremely powerful telepath known as the Shadow King was able to escape the loss of his powers by transferring his mind throughout the multiverse to the alternate world of Earth 6141, where he was able to successfully possess the mind of this world's Charles Xavier before the X-Men were even formed. Combining both of their telepathic might, this version of Xavier turned all of his students into perfect killing machines and placed them firmly under his psychic control, getting them to kill any superheroes who tried to interfere in the Shadow King's schemes. Number 6, Zombie Peter. This alternate version of Peter Parker hails from Earth 2149, sometimes referred to as Earth Z or the Marvel Zombieverse. In this reality, Peter did his best to hold out and avoid becoming infected, but ultimately did succumb to that after being bitten by Steve Rogers, known as Colonel America in this reality. After being bitten, Spider-Man began to transform into a zombie. Before the change overtook him, he hoped to get Aunt May and Mary Jane somewhere safe and return home, only to be overcome by the infection. As a result, he ended up eating both of his loved ones, unable to resist the hunger he felt deep inside himself. Spider-Man in this reality goes on to become one of the zombie Galacti, taking on the power cosmic after eating Galactus. However, in the end, he's also one of the few surviving zombies who aims to prevent the spread of the zombie plague to other universes, eventually becoming a hero once more. As so many evil Spider-Men do, they always come around in the end, even if they're a zombie. Number 5. Spider Carnage Spider Carnage hails from the the 90s animated Spider-Man series. Here, Spider-Carnage hailed from an alternate reality where after being cloned and losing both his Aunt May and his Uncle Ben, he began to question whether or not he was the real Peter Parker or the clone himself. As this version of Peter was filled with rage, Carnage entered his world via a portal and bonded with this alternate version of Peter Parker who then became Spider-Carnage. Spider-Carnage threatened the existence of the entire multiverse and it took a team of heroic Spider-Men coming together to stop him. Eventually, he was convinced by is still living alternate version of Uncle Ben, that what he was doing was wrong, but was unable to remove the Carnage symbiote from him at that point, so he ultimately sacrificed himself to save the world from the evil of Carnage.
rage. And kind of the evil of himself, because he was so filled with rage and hate. Number four, Patient Zero. This version of Peter hails from the reality belonging to the series Marvel Universe vs. The Punisher, the reality of 11080, where Frank Castle, aka The Punisher, was the last known survivor who was forced to take on, you guessed it, the entire Marvel Universe, after the world was ravaged by a deadly and horrifying plague. Here, Peter ends up becoming Patient Zero after a virus, which is the plague, is accidentally released that turns people into violent cannibals. Peter himself devours Rhino during a hockey match and is taken to be researched by the Fantastic Four. However, he does not stay quarantined as the virus spreads to Ben Grimm of the FF, who then releases him. He goes on to become the leader of one of the cannibalistic tribes involved in a turf war. The Punisher ends up killing him after helping to rescue a pregnant Mary Jane in exchange for information that Patient Zero has. I don't think this version of Spider-Man is ever really fully redeemed. He does try to save Mary Jane though, so that's something. Number three, Patton Parnell. Patton Parnell has to be one of the most evil incarnations of Spider-Man around. He's evil to the core. He literally becomes a Spider-Man, turning into a spider-like human hybrid after he is bit by a radioactive spider. Patton was also kind of always a creepy kid, likely as a result of mistreatment that he suffered at the mercy of his uncle Ted. He had a crush on his next door neighbor, Sarah Jane, and enjoyed disturbing scientific pursuits such as burning ants with a magnifying glass. What fun. When he transformed into Spider-Man, he became more confident in himself, but also acquired a taste for live animal and human flesh. He also was capable of laying eggs, as Uncle Ted would horrifyingly and personally find out after young Patton took revenge on him. That's all I'll say about that, but we might be showing you a scary panel of that right now. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the, the editor's doing in this video, but cue scary panel of Ted having spiders coming out of him. Ugh. Number two, the spider. This is a version of Peter Parker who also merged with the Carnage symbiote and was possibly driven criminally insane by it. Or was criminally insane to begin with in this reality, perhaps. This version of Peter hails from the reality of Earth 15. Not much is known about his home reality, mainly what we know of it involved Peter's own history. This alternate version of the character bonded with the alien symbiote that is often referred to as Carnage on Earth 616. He became an infamous mass murderer who apparently enjoys hurting people. He made his first appearance in the Exile in issue number 12, where he showed up with a team of other heroes who were drafted into a multiversal version of Weapon X. I mean, they are heroes there, but they also kind of shady, you know? I mean, not all of them are, but definitely Spider is. Number one, Wolf Spider. Wolf Spider comes from the animated show Ultimate Spider-Man. He was an alternate version of Peter Parker who hailed from the reality of Earth 16827 and was bad to the bone. Unlike many other alternate versions of Spider-Man, for some reason, Wolf Spider became a villain instead of a hero when his spider-like powers manifested. He was a merciless killer, fighting to oppose anyone who fought on the side of good, was a hero, or believed in the ideal of responsibility. He even ended up killing his own reality's version of Miles Morales. And if that doesn't make you evil, I don't know what is, because Miles Morales is the best, and he's such a sweetheart. How dare you do that, Wolf Spider? I can't. I can't abide. Coming in at number 10, we've got a video game honorable mention with the Wolverine symbiote from the game Spider-Man Web of Shadows. In this title storyline, Wolverine has traveled to New York City to deal with a growing symbiote infestation, and even briefly fights Spider-Man when he believes the wall crawler is actually Venom. Unfortunately for Wolverine, he finds himself overwhelmed by actual symbiotes on top of a church and attacks Spider-Man again as the Wolverine symbiote. With all of his usual healing abilities on top of all the symbiote enhancements that the alien parasites offer, this version of Wolverine might just be one of the grossest versions we've ever gotten to see. Coming in at number 9, we have the brainwashed Wolverine of Earth 14850. At one point in the regular Marvel Universe, Wolverine was captured and brainwashed by Hydra in order to assassinate the Avengers, but luckily was able to be deprogrammed before he did any real damage. On this alternate Earth, however, the deprogramming never took place, and Wolverine's killing spree of superpowered heroes was able to last for months. Armed with all of his incredible abilities, absolutely no remorse, and the addition of Hydra-developed teleporting technology that nullified even Wolverine's usual weaknesses, and this was a horrifying enemy that even the Avengers couldn't handle. Coming in at number 8, we've got a live-action detour with X-24 
Thor from the 2017 film Logan. An allegedly perfect clone of Wolverine, but with none of the compassion or humanity, X-24 was treated like an attack dog and followed the orders of Xander Rice to hunt down and capture the real Wolverine and the young mutant girl he was protecting. Based on Wolverine during his prime years, he was able to physically overcome the true Wolverine and was only able to be defeated at the last minute by a bullet made of pure adamantium right to the skull. Coming in at number seven, we have the vicious Vampire Lord Wolverine. In an alternate universe where vampires have launched an all-out assault on the United States, most of the X-Men are bitten and mind-controlled by the Lord of the Vampires, Dracula. Unfortunately for Dracula, however, Wolverine's healing ability allows him to regain his own mental control despite becoming a vampire, and thus is able to overthrow Dracula and become their leader. Consumed by a bloodlust that amplifies his already pretty terrifying rage, Wolverine and his vampire army are able to wipe out most other superpowered life on the planet, only finally being defeated by the combined forces of Doctor Strange and the Punisher as a vampire hunting duo. And at six, Zoom. Hunter Zalman was a serial killer from Earth 2, also known as the maniacal super speedster known as Zoom. Having gotten tired of being the villain, Hunter decided to also become the hero after capturing Jay Garrick, the Flash from Earth 3, masquerading as Jay to gain Barry Allen's trust. When he was 11, Hunter saw his father kill his mother. Hunter's father ended up in jail and Hunter was raised in the foster care system since no relative wanted him. Hunter later became a convicted serial killer and was going through electroshock therapy when Earth 2 Harrison Wells' particle accelerator exploded underground. This ended up connecting him to the Speed Force and he escaped. Solomon killed some police officers on his way out and left one to tell his story. The one police officer said he saw a man zooming around, giving Solomon the alias of Zoom. Zoom later then killed that police officer in his house. Halfway through into number 5, The Rival. Edward Claris is the rival, the arch enemy of Golden Age Flash Jay Garrick. Claris was a chemistry professor at the university attended by Jay Garrick. He believed that he had recreated the formula that gave Garrick his speed. Bitter at the rejection of his research claims by the scientific community though, Claris became a criminal wearing a darker version of the Flash's outfit, the original reverse Flash. The effects of this version of the formula however proved to be temporary and he was defeated when it expended. Decades later though, following the reformation of the Justice Society of America, Claris was retrieved from the Speed Force because he had been put in there at some point by the interdimensional super criminal Johnny Sorrow who invited him to join the new Injustice Society. Now composed of pure speed energy, Claris possessed Garrick's friend and fellow Golden Age speedster Max Mercury to get the Flash's attention. Rival committed a series of swift, gruesome murders at locations that, when mapped out, would spell out a message. We don't talk about the Arrowverse version, though. Like, I know his suit was meant to be similar to Daniel West's reverse Flash, but come on. And for Johnny Quick. Johnny Allen, alias Johnny Quick, is a criminal speedster from Earth 3. Together with his girlfriend and partner in Crime Atomica, he was a member of the Crime Syndicate. Johnny Allen was a high-profile criminal on the run with his equally criminal girlfriend, cornered on the roof of Central City's Star Labs. Allen was struck by a bolt of lightning which shattered the roof, and the duo fell into the lab space below, with Alan landing amid some chemicals. Obviously, this is the thing that ended up granting him his super speed, and he went on to become a super criminal alongside his girlfriend who had also been empowered. He took on the name of Johnny Quick, while his girlfriend took on the name of Atomica. The couple joined the crime syndicate at some point after this. Johnny Quick, as he now called himself, ran through Central City answering to no one, until the day the White House burned, around the time of Darkseid's incursion onto Earth Prime. The being that had destroyed Ultraman's Krypton came to Earth, and an alliance of super criminals formed to find a way to safety. Getting close to the end, in number three, Red Death. Red Death is a speedster that is an evil combination of Batman and the Flash, which already sounds terrifying, but wait till you hear his story. The Bruce Wayne of Earth-52 started off fighting crime with Robin, but Robins kept dying left, right, and center. So understandably, Batman got darker and darker, becoming more extreme with his, um, let's call them methods. Which honestly seems more realistic to me, aside from just quitting fighting crime. Which can't happen, otherwise we wouldn't have this story, right? And DC wouldn't make any money. This eventually leads him to Barry Allen, who refuses to give Bruce his speed force powers. So, Batman, using the various rogues' weapons to fight off Barry, knocked him out. Once Barry was unconscious, Bruce tied him to the front of a cosmic treadmill-powered Batmobile and drove them both into the speed force. I don't even know how that happened or worked logically, but okay, you do you, Bat-Marty. When entering the speed force, though, Barry and Bruce ended up fusing together 
together into an evil Batman with super speed and a lust for killing, while Barry's mind was trapped in Bruce's body. He then gets a visit from the Batman who laughs, who asks him to join the Dark Knight, whose goal is conquering the multiverse. But ultimately, in the number two, Savitar. As a fan of the Arrowverse, I felt like I needed to include one of the most interesting speedsters in the show. Savitar, while sharing a name with another evil speedster from the comics, is actually revealed to be a time remnant of Barry Allen in the show, being more of a future Flash than a Savitar. Honestly, he's like a combination of both. His story, though, is pretty messed up. In essence, making himself and having a classic chicken in the egg scenario. In the post Flashpoint Arrowverse timeline, Savitar comes back from the future to kill Iris West before her and Barry get married. This causes Barry to create as many time remnants as possible, which is basically a clone of himself in order to stop him. But Savitar kills all of them except one. The one that he spares then gets shunned by the rest of Team Flash for not being the real Barry Allen, even though he is still the real Barry. It's weird. So in an act of fury, the Time Remnant runs back in time, creating a new identity for himself as the first speedster and the god of speed known as Savitar. But the suit he wears allows him to travel at basically instantaneous speeds, which the show Flash has not been able to do at this point, even in recent seasons. And finally, in a number one, Reverse Flash. I know what you're thinking, okay? Isn't Eobard just the reverse Flash? Like, not actually a version of the Flash? In the main continuity, yes, but also thinking of the Flash Armageddon crossover, Barry Allen becomes the reverse Flash, so this could be another literal evil version of the Flash. But in the Dark Multiverse Flashpoint story, Eobard also becomes the Flash, and he kind of becomes his own form of hero in a way. A dark, twisted, messed up hero, how bent on eradicating competing heroes in the universe, but still a form of hero, right? Technically, it counts. And I mean, like, he's still scary, all right? And a version of the Flash, so this counts for this list. In a universe where Barry Allen dies while trying to get his powers back with Flashpoint Batman, aka Thomas Wayne. But once Thawne tried to stop the war between Aquaman and Wonder Woman by threatening them and killing Arthur, you know there's gonna be some hell to pay. So he sets on shaping the world in his own image. This involves preventing Batman from ever becoming Batman and instead creating his own superhero team, full of versions of characters we know and love, but all with reverse Flash logos somewhere on their suits, usually. And I have to say, preventing Batman from being created is probably the smartest thing Eobard could have done, because either way, Batman is going to lead some form of resistance against you, so good on you. This is the smartest thing that any villain has ever done in the DC Universe. Alright, at number 10, we have the very silly, but nonetheless evil, Super Enemies. In the 1970s animated TV show, Super Friends, there's an episode in 1979 called Universe of Evil, where Superman travels to an ultra alternate universe to meet the evil counterparts to the Super Friends, very creatively named the Super Enemies. And the team is made up of all those bad guys we've all known so well and grown up with. You know, like Aquaman with an eye patch and Tinted Red Batman. And oh, who could forget the iconic alien monkey Gleek? What a trailblazing team of supervillains they were. But as much as I roast them, they do actually pose a decent threat to Superman in this storyline, to the point where they team up with the military armed with kryptonite weapons, and even bring in their own version of Superman, giving our Superman a good old run for his money. But luckily, Superman Prime finds something called an antimatter flask, which turns all the super enemies back to being good again. Thank God Aquaman retires that eye patch and is no longer so intensely menacing looking. What a relief. Number 9, Justice League of Assassins. Unfortunately, this evil Justice League didn't stick around too long. Being first introduced in Superman Volume 4, number 15, in March 2017, the Justice League of Assassins on Earth 14 were a group of augmented, mostly non superpowered soldiers led by the obviously powerful Superman. The team was made up of Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Flash, Batman, Harley Quinn, and Green Lantern. With the exception of Superman, their powers relied mainly on weapons and technology. But primarily, they used advanced firearms. Ultimately, they were all slaughtered with this Superman being kidnapped by prophecy. Which is a shame, because this team looked super cool and they seemed to inhabit a pretty dark and grim looking post-apocalypse. Could have been very interesting. At number 8, we have the Conglomerate. This group is basically a bizarro version of the Justice League created by Booster Gold. The group is formed after Booster's departure from the Justice League International due to a lack of respect from his peers. When Booster first fails to bring together a competent group of heroes to form the first iteration of the Conglomerate, someone named Claire Montgomery comes in to manage the group. With her, she brings along the likes of Deadeye, an alternate Green Arrow, Fiero, a guy with fire powers, Frostbite, an ice power guy, 
Elastaman, a stretchy man, Element Man, much like Metamorpho, Scarab, a knockoff of Blue Beetle, and Slipstream, a dollar store flash. When they engage in a small friendly skirmish with the Justice League International, the fight quickly turns serious, and everyone learns at once that these new members have actually been brought from an antimatter world called Quard, and they're basically just entirely evil. And always had been. Luckily, the JLI take them down, but it's a close one. Number seven, Zombie Hulk. Whoever came up with the Marvel Zombie story deserves a big old round of applause. I don't care how silly it is. You turned Hulk into a hunger monster. Bravo. When Hulk gets infected with the zombie virus, presumably by Reed Richards aboard the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier, the already basically unstoppable hero becomes a flesh-consuming zombie. After a while, the Hulk and other zombified heroes consumed Silver Surfer, gaining the power cosmic, and after modifying that power, soon defeated and consumed Galactus, making them the next Galactus, or Galacti, or whatever. Which kind of makes sense, you know what I mean? Because zombies eat people, and, and Galactus eats planets. It, it's It's kind of like the natural progression of things, right? Using their newfound powers, the zombies traveled through the cosmos, devouring planets as they went. I think my favorite moment, though, would have to be when Zombie Thanos calls Zombie Hulk out for eating twice as much as everyone else, because, I mean, he's the Hulk, and man's gotta eat. But in return, Hulk calls Thanos Prune Chin which is just hilarious. Number six, Guilt Hulk. Yet another split personality or alter ego of Bruce, the Guilt Hulk is very similar to Devil Hulk, who represents his anger. Only, this version of Hulk represents all the guilt and regret that the Hulk feels for all the horrible things he has done while in his Hulk form, as well as the horrible things done to him as Banner, which ultimately means that this persona is quite a bit stronger than its counterpart. What do I mean by the horrible things done to Banner? Well, apart from being feared and shunned and usually living a very, very lonely life, from a much too young age, Bruce suffered constant abuse from his father, Brian Banner, and this abuse caused all kinds of mental problems for Bruce. The Guilt Hulk, as well as the Devil Hulk, and a few other Evil Hulk alter egos are directly related to this abuse with Guilt Hulk even taking the form of Bruce's father before becoming this thing. This Hulk is incredibly powerful, and it took the combined efforts of many of Bruce's other alter egos to hold and keep the Guilt Hulk persona repressed deep in Bruce's mind. Number five, Pappy Banner. If you've never read the Old Man Logan storyline, I'm gonna warn you now, it is graphic. In this storyline, almost all of the other heroes are dead, and the villains rule, holding various different kingdoms. But Hulk is still here, which shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Years and years of gamma exposure affected him, making him more and more villainous. This Hulk, referred to as Pappy Banner, has claimed a large part of America, which includes California, as his own. He also has a gang now, but these aren't just normal gang members, no, no, no. These guys are all the interbred children of the Hulk and his cousin, Jennifer Walters otherwise known as She-Hulk. When members of this gang murder his new family for fun, Wolverine goes on a crazed rampage, killing almost all the members of the Hulk family, including She-Hulk. The old man Bruce and old man Logan end up facing off, until Bruce transforms into the Hulk, who is massive compared to his normal 616 self. Like, like three stories tall massive. He also really let himself go. Just saying. The Jumbo Hillbilly Hulk swallowed Logan whole, prompting Logan to cut his way out of the Hulk. Number four, Infernal Hulk. On Earth 11638, Bruce Banner was kind of sick of dealing with the raging and the rampage of the Hulk. So, when Spider Man introduced Bruce to Stephen Strange, he became his apprentice and learned how to separate himself from the Hulk entity by sending it to hell and making it a demon. It worked though, except for when the 616 Hulk, along with Deadpool and Spider Man, came to this 11638 Earth. The Infernal Hulk managed to enter back into the realm of Earth, swapping places with 616 Earth's Hulk persona. Infernal Hulk went after Sorcerer Supreme Bruce Banner, who was saved by both Deadpool and Spider-Man. How did they defeat this demon Hulk though? Well, Dr. Bruce reversed the banishing spell that sent Hulk to hell, and just before Infernal Hulk could return to his body, Bruce had his neck snapped, killing him, obviously. But. His spirit lived on in the astral plane, so it's all good. Hey, big guys, sun's getting real low. Oh, wait, no, we still gotta do the top three. Um, well, hey, now that you're here, why not give us a like and a subscribe? 
If you're enjoying the video, that is. It would really help us out. We don't get strong with rage. We get strong with your support. Okay, okay, I'm sorry, y'all. Let's just get on with the video, okay? Number three. Null, breaker of worlds. Ever thought that Hulk should get a hammer like Thor? No? Me neither. But it is awesome. When Kal Borsun, the serpent, sent down seven magical hammers that represented his seven followers to Earth, the hammer Null found its way to our lovely green friend, transforming him into Null, the breaker of worlds. Hulk slash Null went a smashing. Rampaging all over South America, bringing him into conflict with the Avengers, who he defeated, and eventually with a solo Thor. When fighting Thor, Null teamed up with Angrier, Breaker of Souls, which was Ben Grimm the Thing, who was defeated by Thor. But we all know who is the strongest Avenger, don't we? Null was easily too powerful for Thor, and instead of facing him one on one, the God of Thunder threw Hulk into orbit. He landed in Transylvania and started taking on Dracula and his minions. It was only after Inca, disguised as Betty Ross, showed up that Hulk threw the hammer aside and left, wanting to be alone. Number two, Worldbreaker Hulk. Now, it's fair to say that Worldbreaker Hulk deserves the top spot on this list, but I mean, gosh, I just don't think he's that evil. I, I, I'm kind of on his side. I cannot lie, but. He still gets the number two spot because the level of power of this version of Hulk is insane. Near the end of the Planet Hulk storyline, the shuttle he was sent to Sakaar in blows up, killing the Green Scar's wife and children. Hulk reaches a whole new level of anger, which is directed at those who sent him here, the Illuminati. And so, he headed to Earth with his war sworn. He made a quick stop at the moon though to defeat Black Bolt the Inhumans. When he got to Earth, he headed to New York, giving the city a time limit to be evacuated. And when that time limit stopped, well, he defeated everyone who was left. Iron Man and the Hulkbuster armor, the Avengers plus their tower, the US Army, the X-Men, Fantastic Four, Juggernaut, Doctor Strange using the power of Zom, who, if you don't know who Zom is, you should go watch the top 10 most powerful Doctor Strange villains videos. It's insane. And Ghost Rider, all while saving the innocent bystanders. He then threw the Illuminati members he captured into the ring against each other, sparing them as he only sought justice, not murder. He was eventually sorta defeated by the Sentry, who he fought until they both reverted back to their human forms, which is when Bruce Banner knocked out Bob Reynolds. So look, if you haven't read this story, please Please, 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 please do it. Number one, Maestro. Okay, imagine a version of the Hulk with twice his strength who retains the intelligence of Bruce Banner, right? Now take that Hulk and make him a ruthless, tyrannical ruler and you get Maestro. Maestro is a possible future version of the Hulk who kills literally all the other heroes and villains and names himself Emperor over the whole world. Our Hulk first comes into contact with him when Rick Jones' daughter takes him into the future to fight his evil future self. But this Maestro guy, he ain't playing around, okay? In the very first fight, Maestro won by simply snapping Hulk's neck. That's it, done, over. And then he waited for Hulk to heal taunting him and villain monologuing at him the whole time about all the terrible things they go through as the Hulk. The only way our Hulk could win was to bring Maestro back in time to when they gained their abilities, the Gamma Bomb, which destroyed Maestro on the atomic scale. The sheer idea of Maestro haunted Bruce and the Hulk's thoughts for the rest of time, wanting never to become that level of evil. Number 10, Dark Multiverse Superman. Now, I don't know if this is laziness, but the Dark Universe version of Superman doesn't really get much justification as to why his mind snapped and he killed millions of people, his own family, and most of the other superheroes. The Batman of this universe, after seeing this Superman kill his own wife, and after he cuts off Batman's arm, decides that this guy just ain't it, and he transformed himself into a doomsday Batman hybrid called the Devastator, and smashed down this Superman poisoned him and impaled him on spikes. A quick evil Superman story, but it was in service of an amazing Batman story. Number nine, Lex Luthor Superman. Okay, this evil Superman isn't technically Superman, but when Superman and Doomsday are both killed by each other, Earth Prime's Lex Luthor returns to Earth after getting bored of being the new dark side on Apocalypse and learns of Superman's demise. Lex Luthor, with the help of a superpowered armor, steps in and makes himself the new Superman. I mean, not really Lex, but sure, we'll just give this one to you. Now, he had some good intentions, but it's Lex Luthor. 
he wasn't exactly the best person for the job. After having multiple falling outs with the new, real Superman, pre-Flashpoint Clark Kent, he gave up the title of Superman and started acting as an independent hero, and sometimes a villain. Number 8. Parallax Superman In this story, Parallax, the physical embodiment of fear, took over the body of Kal-El, making him submit to Laxi by torturing children, and uses this Kryptonian's powers to confront Sinestro who traps the cocky super entity and teleports him to the caves of Quard, where Sinestro tries to take Parallax out of Superman's body for his own evil plans. But surprise! Parallax has already escaped Superman's body and a battle ensues between Sinestro and Parallax leading to the surface of Quard. Superman escapes from the caves and in a last ditch attempt to defeat the entity, steals Sinestro's power ring and coerces Parallax to swallow his super butt whole. Superman is a clever guy though. He traps Parallax inside the power ring and the day is saved. Gosh, a lot of plot twists there. Number 7. Bizarro Bizarro was a pretty wild idea for a character, if you ask me. Bizarro is the clone of Superman, or at least sometimes he is. At other times, he's actually his own character from a completely different planet. So it kind of depends on which version of Bizarro we're talking about. In many versions of Bizarro's story, as there have been many versions of this character, even some sharing the same continuity, he is a clone of Superman created by Lex Luthor. But in many cases, the cloning or duplicating process basically goes awry, resulting in a sort of reverse Superman. Instead of him having heat vision, he has freezing vision and heat breath. He thinks bad is good and good is bad, so he just ends up being a bad guy. He also is often not too bright. There's even been a version of Bizarro that was created by the Joker, and more recently there was an incomplete clone version of him that was created by Lex, but actually became super intelligent. Number 6. Cyborg Superman What if Superman was the Terminator? That's basically what this version of Superman is. He comes to us from the reign of Superman and is actually Hank Henshaw. Well, Hank Henshaw's brain inside a cyborg more specifically. After Hank's brain is transferred to the cyborg, he decides to become Superman. Cause why not? His plan is to use the alias of Superman in order to destroy Metropolis with a nuclear missile. So a little more insidious than Terminator, really, who is only targeting one person, Sarah Connor. Number 5. Omni-Man Omni-Man is a complex character in the Invincible Universe. He is both a hero and a villain, and sometimes more of an anti-hero. He is the father of Mark Grayson, the protagonist of the story, also known as the hero Invincible. While there have been times he fought against Mark, he has also fought alongside Inside him, to be honest. In season one of the animated series based on the Invincible comic book series, Omni Man takes on and defeats single handedly the Guardians of the Globe. Initially, he told his son that he and his race of superpower beings, the Viltrumites, were heroes who traveled the universe to protect worlds. However, it's later revealed that, um, this was a lie. Instead, the Viltrumites are basically a people who travel the universe looking for worlds to. Conquer, which was also Omni Man, aka Nolan Grayson's objective on Earth. The people of Earth can either surrender and live under Viltrumite rule, or it can resist and be destroyed. That's the way he sees it. Later on in the comic series, however, Omni Man would go on to become the new Emperor of Viltrum. He uses his power and influence to protect the people of Earth against other Viltrumites who would seek to harm it. So, he might seem like a really bad guy, but he's, there's a lot going on with Nolan. Number 4. Hyperion Hyperion basically serves to act as a commentary on Superman. Sure, he's a Marvel ripoff, but that's kind of the whole point of his character. Marvel created Hyperion so they could basically examine Superman as a character, and what it means to have a hero who is literally like a god on Earth. The whole point of him is his similarity and also his subtle differences to Supes. Hyperion is often part of a team called the Squadron Supreme, or depending on the version, sometimes even the Squadron Supreme of America. Now, that definitely feels similar to the Justice League or the Justice League of America, no? Hyperion is also known as Marcus Milton. Typically his origin is that he was an alien who was sent to Earth as a baby. Even more familiar. And not only that, but Hyperion, who can fly, is super strong and super durable, also is apparently the last known survivor of an eternal alien race whose planet died. His origin and character have Superman written basically all over it. He became one of his Earth's premier superheroes and ended up joining the Squadron Supreme. At least that is one of his main origin stories. But also, 
different to Superman. He's kind of a jerk. Number three, Ultraman. This evil version of Superman may not be using his powers for good, but other than that huge con, he has some pretty big pros. Superman's weaknesses becoming his strengths being, you know, one of the big ones. Kal-El is weakened by kryptonite, but for Ultraman, it actually only makes him stronger. Also, DC gave Superman a weakness to magic because otherwise he'd be too OP, right? Well, Ultraman is just that much more OP because he doesn't have this weakness either. He actually has murdered many magic using gods on his own earth, so he's simply better for capability. Sure, the sun weakens him, but he can still beat Superman any night of the week. As long as you don't mind the evil part, this Superman is actually very evil, but also very OP. You don't mind the evil part, do you? We're all a little bored of Superman's goody two-shoes act, right? And if you are, then Ultraman is the villain for you. <laughs> Number two, Injustice. This Superman is a lot darker than the OG, and honestly, I kind of love that about him. You know me, the closer that a superhero is to walking the line of super villainy, or is just, you know, basically a super villain, I like super villains, the more into them I tend to be. Let's not examine too closely what that says about my psyche. Let's just keep going. The Injustice games have great alternate versions of almost every favorite DC character out there. Superman's story and the story of the game itself is set into motion after Joker tricks him into believing Lois is doomsday, which causes her death and the death of Superman and Lois's unborn child. This plus the destruction of Metropolis makes Superman pretty much just lose it. He kills the Joker and sets out to bring about world peace through basically world domination. At the end of the game, if you choose him to win against Batman, he even uses Brainiac technology to control Bruce's mind. Would you want to live in a peaceful Superman controlled world? I mean, It'd be peaceful, but free will, free will. Number one, Homelander. Talk about commentaries on Superman. Homelander is also definitely one of those, but a much more crass commentary, I would say, especially if we're talking about, you know, the comics. This version of Superman is not really a hero, but instead is poised in Garth Ennis's comic series, The Boys, as the main antagonist. Although in reality, there are some bigger bads than him, but still, in general, he is known to be one of the most vile of the soups in the comics. The Boys imagines a harsh, brutal world that offers what it suggests is a more realistic take on what superpowered humans would be like. The actual worst. These heroes pretend to save the day putting on big smiles. Well, really many of them are addicts, murderers, and often worse criminals than those they fight against because they have superpowers. They can do anything they want. Homelander can fly, is invulnerable, insanely strong and fast, and has his own version of heat vision. He's also the leader of the Seven, the premier superhero team from Vought, which, yeah, that would suck to live in that world because he's the worst and he's the leader of the main superhero team. Vought is the company that created superheroes and also works to make money off their brands, marketing them as big saviors and profiting for it while covering up, you know, all the terrible things that they actually do to preserve and safeguard those profits and their business. Number 10, Magic Venom. I'm starting with this Venom because this is technically our 616 Earth Venom and he's also not technically a bad guy, but he's really cool and I love him so Sorry. Eddie Brock has been separated from the Venom symbiote when the Dark Elves and Malekith invade New York. But being the great guy that he is, Eddie gets out there and starts fighting Dark Elves with his normal Humey fists. Even after getting punctured multiple times, he still saves his son from a Dark Elf. All this heroism attracts the attention of a Dark Elf witch that grants Eddie a dream stone. It's a stone that basically turns dreams into reality. She expects Eddie to become the mindless Venom and an agent of chaos in Malekith's army, but Eddie's dream would be to have control over the symbiote, which is what he gets. He uses the suit to fight the Dark Elves, and eventually he becomes a Viking Venom hybrid. That is absolutely the coolest thing. Eddie gives up the suit as it is only feeding on his rage, causing him to only destroy, and gives it to the people of New York who save the day. Not evil, but like I said, sorry. Number nine. Venom Deadpool, what if? On Earth 9211, Spider-Man has the Venom symbiote costume. When Deadpool is hired by Galactus to kill the Beyonder, he is given a weapon called the Recton Expungifier, the only weapon that can kill the Beyonder. When Deadpool tracked down his target to a nightclub, he was enticed into the Beyonder's partying lifestyle. He got jerry curls is basically what happened. While hanging out with the Beyonder in a flying limousine, Spider-Man broke into the car and demanded the symbiote costume be removed from him. Beyonder's limo driver shoots Spider-Man, and the symbiote leaves him, merging with Deadpool. Deadpool. Now, 
Venompool. Beyonder eventually grew tired and longed for more, leaving Venompool and snapping him out of the Beyonder's magic. Venompool attempted to resume his contract and kill the Beyonder, but he accidentally pawned the Rectonic Sponger Fire. He kidnaps and sells a drunken Tony Stark to AIM, and he gets rejected from all the superhero teams because he has Jerry Curls. He's evil because he can't do anything right. It's just, just go with it, okay? Number eight, Spider-Man and the Power Pack Venom. Now, this version of the symbiote is kind of fun. In the Marvel Age miniseries, Spider-Man and the Power Pack, a down-on-his-luck fashion designer literally runs into the symbiote walking down the street and is saved by Spider-Man. During the fight, the fashion designer gets his hands on the symbiote, which he crafts into four dresses for a fashion show that Peter Parker and Mary Jane happen to be attending, with Mary Jane even donning one of the dresses. Partway through the show, the symbiotes reveal themselves and take over Mary Jane and the models, becoming She-Venoms. Luckily, with the help of the power pack and bad European techno music at full volume, Peter is able to remove the symbiote and defeat it. Or is he? Um, bum, bum, bum. Number 7, Squadron Sinister. This isn't so much an evil alternate Justice League as this team actually appears in the Marvel Universe. But I'm gonna count it because I'm just stubborn like that. The original Squadron Sinister was created as a sort of obvious play on DC Comics Justice League characters Superman, Batman, Green Lantern, and The Flash, with the characters Hyperion, Nighthawk, Doctor Spectrum, and the hilariously named Wizard, respectively. The team was created by the Grand Master after he encountered the Squadron Supreme, and they first appeared in Avengers number 69, when they were pitted against the Avengers in a game between the Grand Master and Kang the Conqueror. They're bad guys who are counterparts to four members of the Justice League. I, I gotta stop justifying my reasons. They're on the list. Argue with me down below if you don't like it. All right, at number six, we have the Justice Lords. Appearing in the animated series Justice League in the episode titled A Better World, this evil team is led by a radicalized Superman. Radicalized because he witnesses Lex Luthor murder the Flash and threaten nuclear war. So, Superman decides he'd abandon the typical hero's code of conduct and kill the bald tyrant himself. And in this alternate universe, Lex Luthor isn't just some super rich supervillain working away in hiding, he's actually worked his way to becoming the President of the United States. So, after his death, there is a power vacuum to be filled. And who would be better rulers than this evil alternate Justice League? No one. They didn't think so anyway, so they take over and put in place a totalitarian government with the justification being that they are protecting humanity from itself. And they start calling themselves the Justice Lords, which, I mean, you should sort of know you're the bad guys when the word Lord is in your title. Luckily, the real Superman is able to catch on and take them out of power before anything goes too far. Number five, Injustice League. Okay, so we have the Crime Syndicate of America, but there was also a team of villains put together to fight that team of villains. So, sort of technically making these villains heroes, but also not really because they're still villains. Right? The important information here is that the Injustice League, at least the one I'm referring to, was formed to combat the Crime Syndicate of America from Earth 3. The team's villainous members included Bizarro, Black Manta, Black Adam, Catwoman, Deathstroke, Sinestro or Parallax, Captain Cold, and they were formed and led by Lex Luthor. The team first appeared in Forever Evil number 3 in January of 2014 when the Crime Syndicate of America invaded the Prime Earth universe and tried, and very nearly did, take over the world. At number 4 we have the Injustice Syndicate. I know, lots of groups with Syndicate and Injustice in their names. Well, that's because this evil version of the Justice League actually exists as a sort of combination between the Injustice League and the Crime Syndicate, both of which are included in this list respectively. Appearing in Batman the Brave and the Bold, in the episode called Deep Cover for Batman, Batman manages to travel to their evil dimension and infiltrate their operations disguised as Owlman. He sees that this group comprises of an evil version of himself, along with other evil alternate versions of other heroes he knows and works with. While eavesdropping, Batman learns of their plans to, you know, destroy other universes entirely, which of course, he feels is something he needs to put a stop to. And it can't wait, naturally. So he decides to take all of them on himself. And because he's Batman, and it is his TV show after all, he wins. Those universes can thank him later. Number three, the Joker League. In Emperor Joker, number one, 
of October 2000, the Joker has gained 99.99% of the reality warping powers of the fifth dimensional being, Mr. Mixelpitalik. And he used them to completely warp the world into an insane offshoot of our real world. In this Joker world, he has put together an evil, insane version of the Justice League called the Joker League of Anarchy. The team members include some characters we've seen before, such as Bizarro Number no. 1, Enigma, who's the Riddler, Gravedigger Lad, who is actually Jimmy Olsen, Lois Lane, Harley Quinn, and Poison Ivy. He has also created completely new characters that are wholly original to this story, Ignition, Bounty, Schism, and Scorched. He even has Lex Luthor as a jester. They are basically just the henchmen of this already pretty much all-powerful version of the Joker. Just another way of keeping him entertained, it seems. At number two, I'm putting the Injustice League from the video game Injustice Gods Among Us. Most of us already know how this story goes, but in case you don't, this is one of the cooler and more well-written storylines about an evil alternate version of the Justice League. In most cases on this list, these evil groups are created by an alternate reality, which is always fun but pretty simple to come up with. But this storyline shows a radicalized Superman leading the Justice League to the dark side. And like I said, this isn't because he's an evil version of Superman or one that's possessed by some evil force. He's genuinely turned to evil after the Joker tricks him into killing Lois Lane. So to combat this new unexpected evil force, Batman decides to bring in other members from the Justice League from another universe and the result is some pretty great fighting game. Play. And right as the game was being released, a comic book series of the same name was also being released in tandem, serving as a prequel to the game, where you can derive general story points from the game itself. Most of the backstory I just explained actually comes from the comics. It's cool to see the video game and comic book worlds working in tandem. And they make a pretty cool new storyline that I figure has to be ranked pretty high on this list. Number one, the Crime Syndicate of America. The Crime Syndicate of America hails from the strength-obsessed Earth-3 and is a twisted evil version of many characters who make up the main universe Justice League of America. Its members include Ultraman in place of Superman, Thomas Wayne Jr. aka Owlman, and Alfred Pennyworth as the Outsider, Superwoman who was Lois Lane at one point and Donna Troy at another, the cowardly Harold Jordan and vengeful John Stewart who are both Power Ring which are evil Green Lanterns at different times, John Allen and John Chambers separately also as John Johnny Quick, Atomica, Sea King, Death Storm, Grid, and John Johns. They come into contact with the main universe many, many times, and they almost always spell out bad news, as you'd expect from the antithesis to the Justice League of America. Coming in at number 10, we've got Batzaro from Bizarro World. Hailing from the planet founded by Superman's own twisted doppelganger, Batzaro is the self-proclaimed world's worst detective and spends his nights shooting down couples in Crime Alley as an awful inversion of Bruce Wayne's motivation for being Batman. More of a weird comedic foil to Batman than an actual supervillain threat, Batzaro would eventually try to redeem himself by fighting the Joker and jumping in front of a bullet meant for the real Batman. Meaning, maybe Batzaro had a little bit of good in him after all. Coming in at number 9, we have the Red Death. The first of many dark knights on this list, twisted variants of Bruce Wayne that banded together to escape their dying dark multiverse, the Red Death is a chilling example of what Batman could become if he cared more for his mission than he did for his friends. After the deaths of many of his allies in Gotham City, this version of Batman determined that he was more worthy of using the Speed Force than Barry Allen, and could have saved Robin's life if he was only a bit faster. Unfortunately, this version of Bruce took this plan way too far, capturing the Flash and combining his powers into himself, becoming the Red Death and forcing Barry Allen's consciousness to watch as he began killing every supervillain on the planet and continued his rampage across the entire multiverse. Coming in at number 8, we have the Dawnbreaker. In a dark multiverse world where Bruce Wayne was the one gifted a Green Lantern ring instead of Hal Jordan, this version of Bruce quickly became frustrated with all of the restrictions the Lantern Corps placed on his ring and his ability to wield emotions. Killing every criminal he encountered, Batman's power grew as he combined his ring with the darkness in his own heart, becoming known as the Dawnbreaker as he systematically wiped out every other Green Lantern in the galaxy. By the time he was done, he was the only lantern-wielding entity left in his universe, and joined the Dark Knights in order to find more victims to punish. 
coming in at number seven, we have Owl Man, the evil opposite of Bruce Wayne from the inverted Earth 3. Born under the name of Thomas Wayne Jr., as a young boy, Owl Man murdered his younger brother Bruce and had his butler Alfred kill his parents to ensure that the Wayne fortune was not wasted by their frivolous spending. Using his costumed identity as Owl Man to intimidate the leaders of Gotham into falling under his control, Owl Man was a twisted version of everything that Batman stood for, and every time their universes have crossed over has led to some incredibly dramatic battles. And speaking of evil Batman named Thomas Wayne, coming in at number six, we have the brainwashed Wolverine of Earth 14850. At one point in the regular Marvel Universe, Wolverine was captured and brainwashed by Hydra in order to assassinate the Avengers, but luckily was able to be deprogrammed before he did any real lasting damage. On this alternate Earth, however, the deprogramming never took place, and Wolverine's killing spree of superpowered heroes was able to last for months months. Armed with all of his incredible abilities, absolutely no remorse, and the addition of Hydra-developed teleporting technology that nullified even Wolverine's usual weaknesses, and this was a horrifying enemy that even the Avengers couldn't handle. Coming in at number five, we have the group known as Sinister's Six. And surprisingly, this isn't just a bunch of Spider-Man villains. A group of six red-eyed clones of the X-Men working for Mr. Sinister, this villainous group did have a few run-ins with the wall crawler, but only during the series known as Spider-Man and the X-Men. So it all works out. These evil clones were initially an intense obstacle preventing the real X-Men from getting closer to Mr. Sinister's schemes. But would ironically eventually be defeated by the same condition that seems to always follow Spider-Man related clone stories, cellular degeneration. Better luck next time, Sinister Six. Coming in at number four, we have the twisted Bobby Drake, aka Iceman of the Age of Apocalypse universe. In a world where Apocalypse has taken over mutant kind and only Magneto and a few X-Men are capable of fighting back, the usually optimistic Bobby Drake was forged into a heartless warrior, giving him much stronger control of his ice powers than other depictions of the character, and becoming a living streak of ice that can travel instantly through water to lethal effect. This version of Iceman would eventually betray his teammates and ally himself with Dark Beast, and was only eventually able to be defeated by having his head shoved inside a furnace, a surefire way to finally melt this evil Iceman. Coming in at number three, we have the vampire variant of Storm, known fittingly enough as Bloodstorm. In an alternate reality where Storm was bitten by Dracula before discovering the X-Men, Storm came to Charles Xavier for help with her condition. Unfortunately, her bloodlust was too strong and she wound up feasting on both the Professor and Beast. Horrified at what she'd done, this version of Storm would eventually try and redeem herself after she found herself as part of an invasion force attacking the main Marvel Universe. Universe. While she eventually bonded and made amends with the beast of this dimension, her combination of weather controlling and vampire powers made Bloodstorm one of the more powerful X-Men variants that the regular X-Men ever had to face. Coming in at number two, we have the one and only Magneto from the Ultimate Universe. Magneto might often be an enemy of the X-Men, but in recent years has allied himself with them more often than not. This version of Magneto, however, is much more cynical and dark than the more complex figure of the regular Marvel Universe. And when he believed his children had been killed by Doctor Doom, Ultimate Magneto was furious enough to begin a global genocide. Switching the polarity of Earth's poles with his magnetic powers and beginning the incredibly controversial event known as Ultimatum, this version of Magneto caused the deaths of millions of people and dozens of beloved superheroes and was only finally stopped when Cyclops put him out of his misery with a laser blast directly to the head. And finally, coming to our top spot, we have another version of Professor Charles Xavier, or more specifically, the part of his mind known as Onslaught. For years, Professor X has done all he can to achieve peace and prosperity for mutant kind, while not allowing his anger at humanity to get the better of him. But after all this time of psychically repressing every dark and evil thought he ever had, Xavier had made the perfect ticking time bomb. And when he briefly had a mental battle with his best frenemy, Magneto, a portion of Magneto's less held back personality combined with all of the darkness in Xavier's heart and created one of the most dangerous psychic creations of all time, the villain known as Onslaught. 
A personality made up of the worst possible versions of both Professor X and Magneto, Onslaught is the pinnacle of what can happen when the X-Men go bad.